Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. U-turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. The best way to appreciate the nature and objectives of an enemy is to preserve him in action, is a quote from the first director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States, J. Edgar Hoover. I thought this was an apt quote for our guest today, a former sleeper agent in an elite KGB spy unit who spent over a decade undercover in the United States at the height of the Cold War, who ultimately met his fate, care of the FBI. Our guest today is Jack Barsky, a long-serving former KGB spy who during tensions between the USSR and the United States immersed himself into American society, living a double life full of intrigue and illusion. He stealthily built a corporate career, serving as chief information officer for leading companies in critical industries. His work was recognized and awarded the Order of the Red Banner by the Kremlin before breaking protocol and choosing not to return home. After being discovered by the FBI, Jack has since renounced long-held beliefs and shared his stories, authoring the book Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America, and has been a consultant and speaker on matters relating to counterintelligence and espionage. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite, world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies, and that you could apply to your own life. For our first-time listeners from all over the world, please don't forget to follow on your preferred podcast platform and share with your friends and colleagues. And for our listeners in Germany, the United States and Canada, a big hello. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, Board and Executive Search Firm. In this very different and personal discussion, Jack draws back the Iron Curtain and takes us into the clandestine world of international espionage. From his beginnings as a high-achieving East German student recruited by the Stasi, trained in spycraft in Moscow, and planted into the United States. We talk about the near misses and the events that transpired before coming face-to-face with the FBI and asking, what took you so long? So sit back and enjoy The Spy Who Didn't Come Home. Jack, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, I'm glad uh, to be talking with you. You know, uh, uh, Australia is a dream for me to one day visit, you know. (laughs) Well, we look forward to having you down at our shores sometime soon, Jack. Jack, just to get us started, and for the people out there in Australia who don't know maybe what is happening in the broader aspects of espionage around the world, is the world at war at the moment? Okay, I, I would probably call it Cold War still, but it's a very intense Cold War in cyberspace. Uh, and and I, I have some knowledge thereof because I, I'm well connected with uh, uh, ex-agents, uh, uh, you know, U.S. agents, FBI, CIA, and I'm also very well connected with the, with the cyber community and people who operate in, in cybersecurity. So... Uh, yeah, it, it's it's going back and forth. Now we know mostly about, you know, the Russians, what the Russians are doing. Uh, in that respect, I would say the the NSA is pretty good at not bragging as to our capabilities, uh, because we have we we can we can uh, uh, put Moscow in the dark at night. Guarantee you, uh, they can also do the same to us. <laughs> <laughs> So is it 
is it more intense than it was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Well, it's operating on a different platform that we would think, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, but, you know, the capabilities that uh, uh, and, and the information that also is being extracted that way eventually can lead to attacks that will that, that don't require bombs anymore. OK, and, and imagine if the, and the entire and I also worked in the energy industry in uh, in the U.S., uh, the entire electric grid is extremely vulnerable, particularly because the lines are all above above ground. We are vulnerable. One would hope that, well, okay, let me put it this way. Uh, the two most dangerous countries in the world, and, and, and the one most dangerous country is actually Iran, be, because they they are on a mission and they don't care if they if they die in the process because they know they will go to heaven. And, and in uh, North Korea, not as much because they're not as capable. Uh, but you know, when you when you look at Russia, and and I go back to the Soviet Union, the the Soviet leadership was not suicidal, and so the mutual uh, um, guaranteed uh, uh, destruction actually held uh, both the West and 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 the Soviet Union at double for the entire world except for the these two uh, two exceptions and there's a possibility that other islamic countries also go down that way so is the role of intelligence gathering more heightened i would say not necessarily but but it's mm -hmm. more intense because we have the ability to to use technology that in my time was it was barely in 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 its infancy so then what makes a great spy? It depends upon. There's all kinds of different spies, right? Yeah. So I was uh, an undercover illegal. So I operated uh, as a lone wolf under an assumed identity. So there's a whole different, and I can I can read you the list of uh, traits. The, the KGB was looking intensely for candidates that that fit the. Uh, the, the capabilities that they that you have to have as a as a lone wolf. Okay, so let me let me read that for you. Quickness of intellect, high erudition, language abilities, bravery, focus, quick response to fluid situations, hardiness to stress, adaptation to completely new conditions of life, knowledge of several professions. I did, so far I fit all of them except I, I had only one profession. Well, now, this is my favorite. Well controlled inclination to adventure, ease of transformation and emotional stability. So the same does not apply, for instance, if you are uh, running uh, counterintelligence like mm. the FBI, um, you will be working as a team. And uh, also the ability to analyze is, uh, is much more important and you you have a lot of spies that sit in offices and and just work they, they work for the various spy organizations and they they take what the field folks collected and and prepare it so it is becomes yep. uh readable and understandable by the decision makers because you know the the espionage agencies don't make policy decisions yeah they shouldn't you know sometimes when they go rogue like the CIA has done that but um, uh, generally not. So, um, it's a, I, I don't want to go any further answering that because I was never recruited by the CIA or by some, by one, an organization like that. I was never, um, prepared to work on a team. I, yep. I was from, from beginning to end, I was a lone wolf and, and had to make a lot of decisions by myself. I didn't have I didn't have a, a handler with whom I could uh, have a conversation. There were no conversations. It was asynchronous. It was uh, Morse code for me and and secret writing in the mail uh, for me to them. All right. Let me ask you to start with then. Does one choose to be a spy, or is one chosen to be a spy? I was definitely chosen. I had no no notion, not an iota of a notion that one day. I would be a secret agent. No way. That was not a dream of mine. And I, even if I had it, there was no way to apply. 
Now, you can apply to the CIA and the FBI, but you could not apply to the Stasi or, uh, or the KGB. They were recruiting, period. So you are born in East Germany? Yes. Your father was an ardent Marxist-Leninist. Is that fair enough to say? Uh, he did a good job pretending. <clears throat> and I, I thought about this, uh, and I came to the conclusion that there was a lot of pretending because, you know, he, he needed to, to appear to be that way to have a career. Okay, so when he became a, a principal of a middle school, that, and, and with that came some privileges. We had very good uh, living quarters as a, as a family because my, both my parents were teachers, and, and we were, they were well paid as well. So <clears throat> the reason that I'm now convinced he was pretending, because one time he, he blabbed, he shouldn't have done this, but he had, he had considered uh, putting an antenna on our roof uh -oh. uh, that that was uh, able to capture West German television. We lived yeah. in a in an area uh, we that was called uh, jokingly the clue uh, the the Valley of the Clueless, because uh, we, without that that uh, big antenna, nobody could uh, uh, watch West German television. And when you put that on your roof, the Stasi would knock on the door, and they would tell you to take it down. And then you would be, you know, the study would follow you for, you know, what, you know, what other possible bad things you might be up to. So, he, and he shared that with uh, his wife and me. <laughs> and he said, well, I, I thought about it, but no, we can't do that. <laughs> so for those, the young people out there, Jack, who are you know, going through university, contemplating the, which way they're going to incline in politics and, and democracy and the debate around that and the rise of socialism in the world at the moment. Can you share what was it actually like growing up under a communist regime? You know, while I was growing in, as a child and as a, as a young person, I didn't think it was so bad. However, if you took somebody at the same time who was maybe living in the UK or Australia or, or the United States and put them into our country, they... They would have cried every day because we were very poor. We ha didn't have good food. Malnutrition was prevalent, and and our medical system was was horrendous. I grew up in a, in a in a village where we had one doctor, and I remember this guy because he inflicted a lot of pain on me. Wounds were treated without uh, anesthesia. Uh, oh, really? And and teeth were drilled. I had my teeth drilled um, into adulthood without uh, Novocaine. We didn't have any. All right. I listen. Listen. I. <laughs> uh, I. I also once um, was treated by a KGB clinic. I had a oh, wisdom yeah. tooth problem, and they didn't use Novocaine to pull the teeth. They, they used benzocaine. My God, it was so painful. <laughs> and and that was the best they had. They had to offer. I mean, it was pretty darn terrible. But the one thing that was good about uh, growing up, it was very safe. I grew up in a police state. Uh, there was very little crime. Uh, and parents had no problem letting the kids out and play even in the dark. I have no knowledge of uh, any friend of mine or somebody, somebody I heard of being, being uh, victimized by a crime. And the other thing is, like, I just want to talk about the, the indoctrination, you know, that started with kindergarten. Yes. And it was very systematic. Indoctrination ha didn't just happen in school. It happened in, in the various organizations that you could join as a child and as a, as a teenager and so forth. But it was on the radio, on TV, in the arts, in literature. You know, the, the, there were... And some of the, the books that we read were really well written. They were written by, by very, you know, by honest Marxist Leninists. And, um, and when, when you get all of this together, not just like the intellectual side, when they say, well, this is, this is what Marx has taught, has taught, and this is what Len Lenin has taught, that's not enough. The emotions have to come with it. And we were, uh, we were I mean, my generation was intellectually and emotionally a hundred percent convinced that Marxism-Leninism was the future of the world and the only way to go. 
What about as the individual? Individual? I mean, you're all the same in many regards, are you not? Um, yeah, I mean, the you collective. The you, can co- only, you can only go so far, the, can't the, you? The collective was uh, valued over individualism. However, yeah. however, there was competition, okay? That's, so, yeah. so in school, particularly in high school, you know, if you did well, mm-hmm. then you you had some privileges, particularly in college, when you had better grades, you you got a, a better stipend, you got more money, and I at one point received a, a national scholarship that uh, that was totally elite, but it was limited to a hundred concurrent users uh, in the yes. whole country, and my my stipend went from two hundred marks to four hundred fifty. Which that kind of money I didn't know what to do with because there weren't that too many good things that I could buy. <laughs> I do know a little bit about Eastern Europe, and I've been through there quite a quite a bit during my my life. The value on education, yeah, that is placed, see, is a lot different to what I've generally seen in the West. What is that? Correct. Two journalists, the comments. Uh, the focus, the focus. There was a lot of focus on hard science. As a matter of fact, I, I have a copy of the curriculum of my, my high school senior year. And uh, science and math was half the curriculum. Yeah. And, and there, was, there were no electives. For instance, in math, we, we had what um, would be considered uh, somewhat advanced calculus in, in, in high school. And so, and again, uh, there, there was no exception. You and some people failed. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, uh, um, when when we started the the class uh, that started studying chemistry at college, there was eighty people. At the end of the first year, there were only sixty left. Yeah, right. Uh, because they, the the other twenty couldn't handle it, so it was hardcore. Yeah. There was a little music. There was a little art appreciation, and there was uh, gym. And yep. and then there was a plant indoctrination with the civics one civics lesson and a, and in history there was indoctrination of course literature too <laughs> yep. you know we we read some books that uh, you know were just like uh, infused with communist ideology and are you being watched on a regular basis do you think I would think that because of my proven abilities already in high school. That, uh, yeah, so you're you're a standout student. Yeah, yeah. I you know, I yeah. just I just looked at my uh, the final um, report card. They were all A's, <laughs> okay. not a single B. And and nobody else in in that class. And we were like you know the top ten percent of uh, of the students. Uh, not everybody went to high school. Only only the quote unquote elite. Uh, and that that got me. Uh, uh, it gave me the ability to choose my 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 university, um, but I'm thinking that at one point uh, the local Stasi was informed about me because they collected information on everybody, and um, it turns out that uh, w- one of my classmates actually was already uh, a collaborator with the Stasi, and he he was a guy. I didn't have any a lot of physical fights, but I hated the guy, I, and and we got into a fight, and he was bigger and stronger than me. Fixed him up. Mm-hmm. So, if you're ambitious, you're topping. We're well, doing exceptionally well as an as an academic. Yeah. Where do you go? I know ultimately you were going to pursue a career as a professor. Yeah. And follow your love of chemistry. I wasn't so much in love with, with chemistry. I, I was in love with teaching, actually, uh, because okay. you know, both, both that must have run, run in my blood. And I'm still, even as a manager in, in corporate, I was a teaching manager. I, I At one point, I had like uh, uh, half a dozen directors reporting to me, and I always told them, you know, I'm explaining my decisions because one day you might be in my position. And two of them actually made it to CIO. Yeah, okay, right. But well, the question I was asking, the motivation. So if I'm in the Western society, I educate myself with a view that one day I will use this education or part of this education to lead a good life. Yeah. Okay. 
and I've got a lot of different choices in a career to consider. Same here, actually. Did you have a plentiful choice of careers when you finished university in communism? No. If I, if I had uh, uh, graduated and then said, you know, I don't, I don't want to get a doctorate, I don't want to be a professor, then, then I would have been assigned somewhere. And I would have gotten a, not a great salary, but I knew what tenured professors were making. I once uh, yes. I, uh, saw that in a, in a party document, how much, you know, a percentage of their salary, and they, they were paid like three four $4,000 a month. Yeah, right. Not dollars, yeah, right. Uh, marks. And marks, so, yep. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I really, I wanted a career, and the other thing that uh, went with it, uh, we were like demigods in, 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 in society. This is not like in, in the, in the U.S. Everybody who teaches at college is a, is a professor. They, mm -hmm. Whoever was able to call themselves a professor was, was the individual who made that money, and, yes. uh, and was highly respected in, in society. So you okay. know, not you know, there was not everything was equal. There was this mm. elite, and of course, um, for me yep. to actually become a professor, I had to be a party member. So I uh, became a party member at the end of my first year. What was it like growing up at home then? The the most important uh, influence uh, that my parents uh, had on me was that I did not experience love. I never once saw my parents being affectionate with each other. No hugging, no kissing, no I love you, sweetheart, nothing. And they treated me the same way. I had a brother. We, we were, you know, iron discipline, uh, perform well in school, do chores in the home. Uh, and you know, if you do well, you know you 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 get a little bit of pocket money, uh, but you need to also account for what you're spending it on. So I had a little booklet where I, you know, ten cents for uh, one scoop of ice cream and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, discipline, right. hard, tough love, and actually, I'll give you one example where, where the tough love uh, would have put uh, my parents in jail for for child abuse. Right. All right, so I um, I come home from from summer camp. I was maybe eleven years old, and I had a wound in at the sole of my left foot, and it was uh, somewhat deep because I had stepped onto something a, a, a sharp piece of wood while we were playing soccer barefoot. Okay, yep. And um, since and I didn't get any medical treatment because it was the last day, so I I came home bandaged, and my mother took the bandage off and said, "Oh." This looks bad. You need to go to the doctor. She put the bandage back on and made me walk a quarter, a little over a quarter mile to the doctor. So then, that's insane. My my my, my dad had a motor motorcycle. Yeah, right. And he was home. Okay. So and 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 just to add to the cruelty the, the doctor who i told you inflicted a lot of pain that was one of the instances not the only one uh, so he um, w when he put me on the exam examination table he he waved the nurse over the big big german woman and he said sit on his leg <laughs> and then he started to cauterize the wound with uh, silver nitrate oh. you know how much that hurt and when he was done, he bandaged it up and said, now you can walk home. <laughs> and so I was limping, and I wasn't thinking that, but uh, in, in subconsciously I became aware that the, the people, the, the, the doctor and, and the parents who, should, who would most like, should most likely take care of you didn't do it. So mm. um, already I had this mindset that I've got to, work on my future and on, on my life without getting much help. Yeah, okay. And also, I guess, when you look back in your essay that you wrote, How Did We Get Here? The Road to the Age of Unreason. I think you mentioned that you're driven pretty much as a young man by the power of logic and reason. Yeah, except that there's, the, there's one exception when we're talking about the ideology. I mean, we were taught that Marxism and Leninism were, were on par with science. 
we had a class in, in, in high school that called the scientific Marxism Leninism. <laughs> and, you know, there's logic within the Marxist construct, but it's false. Mm. But other than that, you know, the logic really was applied very well and appropriately uh, when it came to sciences and, um, and math, math, math. So, yeah, of course I had feelings, but um, my, my feelings were like immature, not well-developed. So you go to university. Mm -hmm. Were you doing well at university? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, partially because I was one of the smartest, but I wasn't necessarily the smartest. Right. Um, and already uh, one of the foundations uh, of, of becoming a really good spy w w was already visible. And I, I wasn't mm. aware of that, but I was a really good manipulator. So okay. here's, here's, here's the, the one where, where I got my reputation. You know, I, I was doing well. I was, you know, an A student mostly. But the, we had um, uh, small sessions, class sessions with one of the professors was really arrogant. You know, we, he, he, because he was just like, he, he was looking down on us. And we had just uh, covered in, in a lecture some uh, how to derive a, a certain formula of about 15 steps in thermodynamics. And f for the heck of it, I, I memorized that the night before the, the small session. And then, and then the, the, the little assistant professor, who nobody liked, but he said, you know, we're going to have a, a, an exam and, and you better memorize this formula. And I, like a wise guy, said, oh, if you don't remember it, you can just derive it. And he thought, nah, I got this guy. I get, he said, Mr. Dittrich, come to the blackboard and derive away. And I went there and very, very <laughs> methodically <laughs> did, uh, did exactly that. And that, I mean, my, 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 my fellow students, they, they were grinning and they, because I, I showed them up. But, but, but what he took, took away from that was that I was an exceptional student. And he yeah. shared this with the other guys that, um, you know, that taught uh, different parts of chemistry. Mm -hmm. And we had things that they called collo colloquium, I think, um, where like a group of three would have a verbal exam, would go and talk to the professor about whatever. And it, the result of my performance was that I always was the third to be asked, and I always got the toughest question. And I tell you, there were many times when I wouldn't have had an answer to the easy questions. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So, interesting, uh, and see. you know, and so, so I created a reputation, and and I was very ambitious. Okay, very ambitious, and very, very uh, convinced that I would. And there was no limit uh, to to my rise um, through the ranks. Okay, so stand back, and I'm thinking if I'm going to make an approach to you from a spy approach, right? Mm -hmm. You're a classic, aren't you? I'm a classic? You're definitely in my radar. Of course you are. You're intellectually arrogant. <laughs> yeah. Right? You're challenging. You're ambitious. Yeah. Don't we want you on our team? You bet. But but uh, yeah. you, you also have to figure you're out... Setting us, you're absolutely my nut. You've got, to be, you've got to be one of my top targets, sure. Yes, but I also have to, I also have to believe in, in the cause. Yeah. And uh, and I aren't I testing that? Aren't I testing that in the background anyway? Yeah, of course. And, and it, it it was known because I was um, very active in the in the um, youth uh, movement uh, and at university. I uh, I was a party member, and they, they, I mean I had an unblemished record in, in that regard for sure. So what happened? Did you get a knock on the door one day? Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, and uh, that, that it was interesting in hindsight. I, I put this all together. Um, how did that person know that I was there? He had inside information because I, I lived in a, in, a, in a dorm room that I shared with, a, uh, with another fellow. But he always mm -hmm. left uh, this, the town we, we studied in and, and went home over the weekend because he could. 
I couldn't. Yep. I was too far away. Okay. So I'm sitting there on a Saturday afternoon and doing a little bit of homework, um, and I get a, there's a knock on the door, and um, when, very rarely did we have outside visitors. So normally when there was a knock, there was the saying, I'm coming in, it would, would have been one of my uh, fellow students. Yep. And there was nothing. So I had to say, come on in, please. And here, here comes in this this German fellow. There was a some, somebody who, who spoke uh, perfect German, and, and he introduced himself as a representative uh, from the company called Carl Zeiss Jena. That was the number one company in town, and it was actually a company that was rather competitive internationally. They made high high quality optics, and okay. that company still exists in Germany today. So, uh, okay, I'm thinking you're full of shit. I'm sorry, uh, because <laughs> that didn't make any sense. Because he said he wanted to just find out what my plans are after. Uh, after I, uh, I'm done with the, my, uh, you know, after I graduate, on a Saturday afternoon, knocking on someone's door. It, yeah, <laughs> and 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 the, the the guy was a total idiot, and this was such a bad cover story because everybody who knew something about uh, the system knew that you were you nobody recruited students. You had two choices. Mm -hmm. If you were in the top ten percent, you could stay and get your doctorate, and uh, and um, and then most likely you, you possibly could be become a professor or a lecturer or whatever. There were different titles, but uh, yes. uh, most people with a doctorate were then assigned to you know industry, and so his 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 backstory, his cover story was completely idiotic. So I I immediately thought Stasi. Uh, it made sense because he spoke German. Uh, but um, I I played along. We did a little small talk, and then maybe ten minutes into the conversation, he he did a one eighty, and he said, "You know what? I have to admit, I'm really not from Kalsas. You know, I'm from the government." All right. <laughs> he set himself up for a, a, a question that would have been difficult to answer, but I only thought it. I didn't say it. I wanted to play him. Um, he, I could have asked him what part of the government. <laughs> That's right. You know, and and then, you but know, hey, but he um, you took the bait. Yeah, and then he then he said, and and I knew I I wasn't afraid of the Stasi. I I knew I had done nothing wrong. They, so th that that was not a hostile interview. And he okay. asked the question, the the question, the crucial question that he came to ask: Could you picture yourself one day working for the government? And so I gave him the answer that he that he really liked. I said yes, but 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 not as a chemist. So we we communicated between the lines. So he, yeah, yeah okay. I gave him an answer to the question that he didn't ask. Would you like to be a spy one day? And I, I figured it had to be it had to be along those lines, right? Uh, uh, and I said not as so a, not you, as a so chemist. Uh, so he knew that there were chemists who worked. Who worked uh, yeah. Yeah, for the Stasi in the forgery department, for instance? Mm. Yeah, but you're not going to be one of those. No. <laughs> so, so that was the the uh, the inclination for adventure that that made me give that answer, and knowing that my God, this would be great. I could travel and I could live the good life. I mean, I would be very special. And you know, in my mind, I also knew that I I would be breaking laws everywhere. And I didn't like the law. I was always a contrarian, and 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 I I didn't like to be told what to do and where to go. But I had to like, you know, I I was aware that I couldn't actively pursue that kind of an attitude. I had to fit in. But inside, I I wanted to be free. <laughs> so Jack, so I I work in the world of executive search. Yeah. We've got to make approaches all day long to the leaders in business yep. or in society, <clears throat> but they've also got the challenge themselves. They've got to bring in the future leaders. I'm interested in how you were courted through this process. So you're speaking at riddles between each other, inferring stuff. Okay, yes, I'll come on board, but not as a chemist, right. potentially. What's next steps? Well, the next steps, he, um, he invited me to to lunch, which is the German version of dinner, uh, you know, a good meal and yep. always a glass of beer at the 
best restaurant in town. And okay. when I showed up there uh, one day, uh, he, w he was sitting at the table and there was another fellow at the table. And he got up and walked towards me and said, come on, come on. We, this is, uh, by the way, this is Herman. We, we are working with our Soviet comrades. And then he said, I got to go. And so it was me and Herman. Okay. And so yeah. <laughs> I knew that I was with the KGB. Man, that so Herman is a handler. He, yeah, he, he was. A, he spoke with a Russian accent, and he was a local agent, sort of like he he played a similar role to the role that Putin played when he operated in Dresden in East Germany. <clears throat> you know, oh, liaison with a with a Stasi, some recruitment, um, and some minor tasks, but but certainly not uh, you know hardcore espionage. Okay. Okay. So, um, and Herman and I met informally for like eighteen months. So um, he he just like really. What's this on every every couple of weekends? He analyzed or? me, and he, here's what <clears throat> what yeah. came in handy as far as our, our interaction. Since I mm. did not have a a close relationship with my father, I mean, I never had a father son talk with him. He he just like he was useless as a as a father other than, you know, disciplining me and occasionally hit, hitting me with a belt. Right. Um, so here's a gentleman who is um, a few years older than me, maybe, you know, seven, eight, nine years older. Yep. And he became a father figure. So yeah, I shared right. everything that was in me with this guy, everything. But he's preying on that, isn't he? Well, he, that that was. He, he's he's manipulating you just as much as you manipulate others. I don't others. know if he's manipulating you know, me, but he, he he gets to know me well, really he's not well. Be your best, he's not going to be he's not going to be your best friend, is he? I think he, yes, because you, you, is he or not? As a handler, you you want to be the best friend a uh, friend of the person that uh, that you're handling. You've got to give at least the impression, and that means you have to be genuine. Yeah. Okay. So that's the forgery of trust. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. That 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 was important, okay. and uh, and 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 also what what helped me. And so he he could, I guarantee you, and I wasn't aware of that. I just like liked interacting with him. That every time we had a talk, he went back and 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 wrote a, a report about it. And that pile probably got mm -hmm. pretty thick. Um, and he also gave me some tasks. And the one thing that I liked, um, uh, what sort of tasks? Okay. Um, one of them I hated, like the pest um, investigations on the false flag. Also, so I had to. What do you mean? I had to. Uh, the, he gave me an, an address and a name of a. In, in, yes. In most cases, that may have been a house in the suburbs, and it, I had to do a couple of them. And I had to ring the bell, and introduce myself as somebody who I wasn't, and uh, and uh, and then find out. Some information that this person knew, and in this one case, it was about finding out uh, some information about a relative of uh, that family who lives lived in West Germany. So my my false flag was I I introduced myself as a student of sociology, and I I have the, I have this task I have a, a survey, and if you wouldn't mind, could you answer? some of these survey questions, and people wouldn't say no to that. You know, a lot of them were innocent, but some of them were somewhat directed so that all of a sudden, in the informal part, when the interview was over, we were talking about, you know, our relatives, and I volunteered some of my information, and, and this lady volunteered some of hers, and so I collected something that she didn't know what it was for. Okay. Okay. So that was the uh, another one was uh, uh, he, he we drove by uh, a an object uh, a multi story object. Uh, he he told me to uh, find out w what the people in there are doing, and befriend a couple of them. I did that too. Right. Um, That's your tasks. And and, uh, and so th those were like there were few. A few of those, um, but he just uh, he just wanted to know, can I do this kind of stuff? Because that it made me very uncomfortable. But my ambition says I got to do it. I, by the way, that skill I never used in while being active as as an agent.
Never. You don't think so? Oh, no, I did not. Bread and butter. I, no, no. Uh, you, you can't. You can't appear on the false flag if you're an illegal, because some, some, somebody might find out who you really are. Yeah, but you're living a false identity anyway, are you not? It, no, but no, but it's high risk. Look, if I if I go, for instance, and and come up with a story, mm -hmm. rather than uh, introducing myself as a computer programmer, mm -hmm. um, and then one day. That person shows up at, at, in, the, in the place where I'm working and says, what are you oh, yeah. doing here? Yeah, you're right. And the, and, and the, the KGB was extremely risk-averse with us. We were, we were super important assets for them, and we should, could not, could not be endangered in any way, shape, or form. That's why there was a hard law, a hard uh, um, that uh, a, another agent would never meet an illegal in the country where he operates. No way. Right. Right. So what you see sometimes on TV or in the movies that, you know, the people are like getting together and they're talking and they get advice from the handler. The handler, the handler sits in Moscow for, for me um, and I never got to talk to him. He probably didn't even know my name. I'll come down. I'll come down in a second. With okay. Herman. So, With Herman. So one more thing I want to ha uh, mention. Yeah. Um, I, I got a bit of a sense of, uh, you know, what it was like br breaking the law because uh, – at, at first, uh, Herman and I met in a car, and then we met in a in a in, a, in an apartment. Uh, yeah, so never in an office. No, 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 in an apartment. And but but he would give me um, West German magazines to read. Uh, yeah. Okay, and that that if you were in possession of of something like that, that that was a that was a crime. <laughs> yeah, but but I'm trusting you, and I'm supporting you and I'm yes. giving you special yes. attention are I not and and then we talked yeah, interesting. quite a bit of what it was like to you know go to the west and, and operate there and the and the bait was still out there because there was literally a potential that I could wind up rather wealthy and I I, I get to that in, in a different section of the of this interview okay so courting goes what you say 18 months yeah with Herman? With Herman. All right. When does D-Day come along? D-Day? Decisions have got to be made. Yeah, decisions have got to be okay, made. Okay, yeah, well, that... Which, um, which step? At, at that point, he probably had uh, shared um, his uh, his analysis and all the data that he collected with uh, headquarters in Berlin. Yeah. And yep. they decided, well, we, gotta, we, we want this guy. That... Um, and so I, I was sent to Berlin without understanding, without knowing, anticipating that I was going to be recruited. I was sent to Berlin to, uh, for sort, sort of a practice trip. And I, in Berlin, I had an, another handler. I forgot his name. I, I, I never worked with him beyond the three weeks. So he gave me some tasks, and, and he gave me some literature to read that I could uh, read and in the privacy of, uh, of a hotel room. And, um, and him and I talked about what it would be like. And again, you know, there was this the debate was dangled in front of me. And then the, the very last day of my being in, in Berlin, uh, he took me to headquarters, um, which I only knew was headquarters for the Soviet army, but the KGB was there too. Uh, when the K KGB was very secret, you know, you wouldn't know where they were. Uh, so, and um, I was uh, led into a a uh, an office that was decorated with uh, some revolutionary like pictures and the bust of Felix Jarzinski, the founder of uh, oh, yeah. the Cheka, the forerunner Cheka. of the KGB. Yeah. And yeah. behind that desk sat a very unimpressive short man. And he, he spoke only Russian. He didn't speak German. And clearly he didn't speak English. At, at that time, uh, I, I, I wasn't able to speak English anyway, but he, he didn't speak German. So I understood enough Russian to un get what he was saying. It was all revolutionary small talk, <laughs> you know, cheering you on, you know, we you know, this is why we're doing this. And uh, then... Very abruptly, he changed the tune and he said, all right, here's the question. Are you in or not? Well, I wasn't prepared for that because up until that point, you know, I had the, I was toying with the idea. 
I didn't really think, I didn't make a decision in my mind. I, I just didn't take oh. it that seriously. You know, by the way, I, I haven't taken life very ser seriously up to this point, with one exception, when I'm responsible for others. And that's the adventurous nature of me. So, so I was just playing around with the idea. And so I, I played for time. I said, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not really trained. I don't know if I, if I can do the job. He said, well, we determined that you can, and don't worry about it. We will train you. But it's one thing I got to tell you. We will, we will work only with people who can make good decisions very quickly. So you got until tomorrow noon. That made for a sleepless night. You're listening to No Limitations with special guest Jack Barsky. On our next episode, I sit down with Alan Beecham, Managing Director of Toll Group. You know, we all form connections and relationships with people that we work with. The person who gave me my first management start in Rolls-Royce moved over to a Formula One company and one day somehow tapped me on the shoulder at a point where I was probably vulnerable and said, I'm working over here, do you want to come and have a go? And I said, oh no, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm going to stay in Rolls-Royce for the rest of my life. This is a great company. And he said, just come and have a look. And he showed me the car, he showed me the racetrack and uh, I promptly resigned and I went to Mercedes. Be sure to join us on our next episode. And now back to the show. Okay. So you go back to that hotel room. You've got to give a decision by lunchtime yep, tomorrow. Back and forth. When, back. when did you arrive at the decision? In the morning? Pretty much. And it was, it was, um, it wasn't a, a, there wasn't a decision based on analysis. This was, this was driven by feelings, like many of my other important decisions. Uh, debate won over. You know, the, the adventure, the good life, the ability to see the West, the ability to break yep. the law. This is all feeling based. And, um, and, and the pride that came with being recruited by the most powerful espionage organization in the history of the world. So mm. you can't say no to that. Even though, you know, I, I had a hard time, you know, leaving the, the, the town where I studied and where I worked as an assistant professor, I had, I, I had to say goodbye to a good career. And, uh, and I had to say goodbye to my family, and my family was my basketball team. Okay, <laughs> yeah, they, we were like really tight, um, and um, I had no problem saying goodbye to my mother. And my father was uh, not in my life anymore. There was a divorce, so um, so. Uh, but you know, and once the decision was made, I never looked back. Okay, so you've signed up. You're in with the KGB. Yep. You can't speak a word of English yet. Nope. I, I, the the school English, uh, uh, I, I had practically forgotten. So yeah, no, there was nothing there. So what is indoctrination to the KGB? Oh, uh, important. I had to believe. I had to absolutely believe, and I had to believe that I uh, joined an organization that uh, would be instrumental in bringing bringing about the parody, the workers' paradise on earth. I, I believe that with all my heart. Okay. All right, so you're a believer. Do you then leave Berlin and go to Moscow? What happens? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I got to tell you that first I went to Berlin, and they wanted, mm -hmm. they, they, they trained me to, to go to West Germany um, because the first thing to, that they gave me to read was the West German Constitution. Um, and I, I, I had to, they told me that everybody who operates in a foreign country needs to learn another language. And they gave me a choice and I picked English. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that I learned it very rapidly and quite well. And it turned out that I didn't speak it like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> you know, I'm the party pooper. <laughs> So, because I had this innate ability to imitate sounds, yeah, right. and that is what what really the light bulb went on at, at the center in Moscow. They had a candidate that they could train well enough to go to the U.S. as a born citizen to pretend to have been born there, which mm -hmm. most illegals, it may well be that all the others were smuggled in through third countries. Um, their favorite uh, 
country was Brazil. Still is today for Russia because it it it, uh, it is supposedly very simple. I spoke with I once had an interview with somebody from Brazil and and it's very easy to gain Brazilian citizenship. So you you live there for a couple of years and then you come legally to the United States, but having been born there, you know, there's there's uh, there is no little red flag go, go, uh, possible, you know, you know, I've always been here, right? And so that's how I wound it's, up in Moscow. Two years. When you joined the KGB, yeah. now, you know, so, so and this is people who they think through. When I join an organization, if I join Coca-Cola, yeah. or if I join a big mining company, part of my my education, my indoctrination, I learn a great deal about the organization from what the CEO does yeah, all yeah. the way through to the first junior. In other words, I, get, I understand all the mines around the world. I understand what minerals they, they mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> sure. They source, etc. That's not KGV, is it? How much did you ever None of that. know about the organization? None of that. Uh, and I, I was smart enough not to ask any, anything. They, um, I, I never knew until you know I, I was able to do research after I, I left the KGB that that I was in the uh, in the uh, directorate S. That was the director, directorate S. Directorate, okay. directorate in charge of illegals. Uh, under yep. the first directorate, which was espionage, the second direct- directorate was counterintelligence. There were like 30 different directorates, and most okay. of them were sort of, uh, they, they they were the police, the secret police, the uh, the folks that put people in gulags and, and so forth. The KGB had at that time 500,000 full-time employees and several, right? seven, several million vo- volunteers. It's very powerful, and the illegals were the elite, or what? Where, did, where does the illegals fit into it? Absolutely, um, and I'm um, bec- because you, you have to you have to understand. Again, we were totally isolated. Um, I had one handler while I was in Moscow, and some people came in. You know, obviously, I was trained in in tradecraft, so the, the specialists would uh, would be present and. Uh, well, but but they I introduced myself with my code name. I, you know, there was Dita. Okay, I was Dita for everybody. Okay. And um, and anyway, um, so I was only sh- they were only shared with me what they thought I needed to know to do my job, and I didn't need to know how the how how the KGB is structured. You know, I I didn't know any of that. I didn't need to know anything. I didn't need to know Russian, uh, and. Um, um, that had certain limitations, but again, I told you, I, I was already a Soviet state secret, and I had to be well, well um, uh, protected. And uh, and you know, this this type of training is very expensive. Mm, Everybody absolutely. else was in classrooms, and they had colleagues. Yep. And and even maintaining us in the foreign country was very expensive. And and I had uh, my my handler actually was really envious. He once said to me, you know, I wish I could I could do what you're doing. I wish I had those language capabilities. So you know, we were admired. And I I know for a fact that every two years, <clears throat> um, I know not. It, no, it's it's not. I don't know for a fact, but I I it's a very well educated guess. Every two years, I went back to Moscow. And I spent some time in Moscow for debriefing and blah blah blah. And I went to spend some time in, in in East Germany. And on my last day before going back to the United States, there was a a banquet. You know, lots of good food, uh, caviar, right. and uh, and uh, super cooled vodka. And there were about you know seven eight people there, some of whom I knew, but. The one person that the most important person around the table, I knew that that he was the most important because he was uh, addressed uh, using the patronym. In other words, Russians have three names, first name, last name, and the patronym. The patronym is is the last one. So you could be last name Alexandrovich Sergeyev. So that is the most polite way to address somebody in Russian. Right. Um, th- that is like the equivalent of Mr. So and So, 
Right. Um, there's something in between in, in, in the South in the United States. If they say Mr. Jack, that's still respectful, but but not the, 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 the highest. And there was always this one guy who was addressed with a patronym. So I would guess he was the head of the, 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 uh, the director at S because he, he just, they had to be, they had to be curious about, you know, the, I was a successful agent and apparently not too many of them were uh, because the, I, that's another educated guess. This mission was bound to fail and I was lucky. I went, um, I should have been busted a half a dozen times. And it, and, and it, it never happened. But so, so, you know, when it turned out that I was able to establish myself as, a, as an American and I had to be very creative, yeah. um, I think they just wanted to get to know me. That makes sense, right? So just quickly, Jack, you, you've got two, you've gone to Moscow and you said you're learning the trade craft. What does that look like? And is that the basis for all espionage thereafter it's all the skills that i didn't have these are skills these are not <clears throat> these are not talents um there may be some talent behind it but uh the, typically the skills so first of all uh, cryptography you know we we communicated and uh, we had encrypted and de uh, and i messages going both ways and they were yep. double encrypted uh, and i was told and the the algorithm was a manual one for, for the most part and I was told that right. this was the, the the algorithm at the time was not breakable unless you exceed uh, 200 usages. Uh, I bet you, with supercomputers, yeah, right. can break them now. Yeah, right. Um, right. So that was one secret writing. How to uh, you know how to put uh, secret messages on 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 an open text in a letter? That was my way to communicate with the center. What does that mean? Secret writing is that putting words in that I should look at? Yeah, so um, so this is how it works. You um, you write you write. A, we, I was limited to two pieces of pa paper per letter, so you write an open text, pretending yeah. that you know the recipient. You know, and you write a bunch of nonsense. You know, so and so. I'm so I'm so uh, I'm so sorry that you you know you came down with the flu and blah blah blah. Um, I was really good at inventing these things. You know? <laughs> Bullshit, right? Okay. <laughs> and then, then you take a, a piece of paper that was uh, um, that was um, Im, 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 impregnated with uh, a trace of a chemical. I was never told, uh -huh. that even though I had a chemi chemistry background, they never told me what it was. Yeah, right. Uh, it was certainly not the standard stuff. You know, you can you can do secret writing with um, the stuff you find in your home. Mm. Um, uh, I think um, uh, um, uh, juice of certain uh, citrus fruits, for instance, I can produce this. Yeah. But no, no, no. This was you had to pretty much know what you're looking for to find that there was something on there that uh, that indicated that there was something underneath. Yeah, right. And so I used that piece of paper as copy paper, and I yeah. wrote on another piece of paper on top of it with a pencil two. And without, and ve very carefully, not to put too much pressure with my with my hand, because that would uh, make a smudge and make the stuff un illegible. Very, very, and it was, and all, all of this was done on a on a, a glass plate that I had to uh, 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 clean very carefully. And oh, that yeah. envelope eventually, with these two pieces of paper, went to a convenience address. Uh, that could have been in it was it was in Germany at one point there was one there was one in Austria and there was also one in South America and my and my, my initiative to teach myself Spanish came in handy because I could actually write letters in Spanish okay. and and then the person who uh, this was addressed to made a signal for a local KGB agent for a meeting. He handed the letter to, to that agent, which uh, the letter then made it into the diplomatic pouch and went to <clears throat> Moscow, where it was then developed. Oh, yeah. So you can imagine that the communication cycle uh, was rather long. Mm. So for, for me to even ask a question uh, about a decision that had to be made within three weeks <clears throat> was useless. 
you know, I had to make all my own, my own decisions. And, right. and obey, by the way, some of the answers that, uh, that were more long-term, they were useless too because they really didn't know what they, what they, they were doing. They, didn't, okay. they had no clue how uh, the United States um, um, society works. And so they gave me a lot of um, you know, wrong ideas how to go about certain things. Okay. Being followed, tracking, all that stuff, I guess, was all part of your spycraft. Oh, yeah. Well. The other things, uh, um, um, surveillance detection. That was a, a key element of my training. We did a lot of uh, practice runs in, in Moscow. The, fu fundamentally, that is, you, you going out into the city, you have to do it in a city. And then you, it was always required to spend three hours going from one place to another, to another, to another, taking different means of trip. Oh, three hours, huh? is it? Three hours is the, three hours is the yeah, sort of yeah, the time they, you went to. It was hardcore. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it is hardcore. and the whole idea yeah, right. was to find on this route connection points. In other words, where when, when you are being observed, somebody has to be right close to you. So otherwise, yeah. they, I could when I'm out of sight, I could do something and hand hand a piece of pa uh, paper to somebody, you know, brush pass that's called, or or yeah. or make a signal or something like that. They have somebody yep. has to be in have has to have me in sight, and um, yep. um, so the 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 team and they had to they use teams, and they used some mm -hmm. they changed. Uh, articles, articles, articles of clothes, um, uh, some some other things that they may, may have carried. How long was the actual program for, Jack? Uh, end to end, from starting in Berlin and to, until I was d dispatched, about four and a half years. Yeah, four and a half years yeah. of training. H how intense is it? You know, there was a lot of self-study involved. There wasn't a yeah, whole lot of interaction. <clears throat> like my English, I did, I did. English every day, including you know, phonetics exercises, listening to uh, radio stations. Uh, is that off your own? Yeah, initiative? yeah, yeah. You know, I, they, okay. So, so, the, so a lot of this whole thing is based on one's initiative. Oh, isn't they, it? they, they, they knew they had a self-starter, and you know, I didn't. I, you know, I, clearly, I didn't know what kind of skills they w w w were going to teach me. Uh, you know yeah. the the trade craft that they brought to me, but then there were these other things that they gave they gave just a headline. So like you need to you need to expand your your knowledge of of the arts. Did you know, Jack, that if you were going to choose English, that your chances were you going to be sent to the U.S. Yes, that, earlier that, on. Or? Oh, absolutely. That when they when they interviewed me in Moscow to determine whether I had what it what it took to um, perfect. My 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 uh, English enough to actually do the job that they had in mind, and that was the United okay. States for sure. Um, All so, right. So, uh, so during the program, you don't you don't do you see anybody else in terms of other students? No, and I had no social interaction with anybody uh, uh, in two years, which gave me great confidence that God forbid I wind up in jail, I probably would be able to survive. Yep, and no one would spill the beans on me. Right. Okay. Did you ever know your boss? I don't believe so, because my my liaison was a young fellow who who yep. was roughly my age, so he, he couldn't yeah, right. he couldn't have been my boss. No. So when when is the decision made? Time to be dispatched. Um, the, there was a bit of a hiccup uh, because I. I was uh, my first trip to an English speaking country was to Canada. And okay. that was I spent 3 months there to just like get acclimatized and get a feel for what it would be like in the United States but but the the major task I had there was to acquire a birth certificate in the mail for one Henry Van Randall. They knew that Henry Van Randall had passed away at an early age. And they knew uh, where he was buried and where the records were kept. So, I um, I sent uh, um, a request. Please uh, send me my my birth certificate. I'm Henry Van Randall. And we they they knew 
they had enough information about the parents. So these are these are my parents, and I passed and uh, passed away, right? <laughs> Slip of the tongue, uh, and um, and and I I I put in a, a money order because I, for the there was a fee, and yep. it took forever. And I waited and waited, and I, you know, I was in Montreal. I was supposed to go to Toronto and some other cities, and I got really impatient. And, and I looked them up in the phone book, that office, and I called them and and I yelled at them. I says, "What's the matter with you? You know, you got my money. I want my birth certificate." Well, within three days, it came in the mail, and I went like, "Yes!" yes. Uh, and then I opened this thing, and. Um, there was a birth certificate for Henry Van Randall, but in big, bold, red letters, it was printed across, deceased. So here was a uh, an individual who died a few years ago, quite a few years ago, and he's asking for his own birth certificate. What's wrong with that? That was <laughs> the first time I should have been busted. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, apparently the, the American... Um, I, I could have been the FBI informed Royal Mounted Police, I mean, counterintelligence yep. in Canada. And they did follow me, but it took them too long to get this going. So, and I know that they did follow me because uh, the FBI, after I, I was all clean with them, they showed me the police sketch that uh, was made uh, made based on the uh, the interviews uh, interview of of the caretakers of the small hotel that I was in. So and and yeah, and, and I was told they followed me on my trip. I should have left right then and there. Instead, I you know well I'm not done. Yeah. My God, I have some other things to do, and I have to prove to myself that I that I pass as a Native American. So eventually, I I did that and pretended to be an American in a in a bar in a Canadian bar that was across the river from Detroit. And I acted like an American. And I said, I was talking to an American. And I said, I said, like us and we, as a, and comparing us to the Canadian and the Canadian beer is better than ours. And, and he, he didn't, he didn't blink an eye. So I, I, at least I had one success, but I, I, I should have been uh, captured. Wasn't. And I made it back to Moscow. And then they went uh, with plan B. And now I had to study Portuguese and um, read about Brazil. So the plan was to smuggle me in through Brazil, right? Uh, yeah. But luckily, I guess, for, for all of us, and for me too, <laughs> uh, a an, an agent in in Washington, D.C., was wandering around on a uh, Jewish cemetery, and he found the, the gravestone of Jack Barsky. And he was oh, able to acquire the death certificate for Jack Barsky, and he parlayed that into a birth certificate. In those days, it was possible to get a birth certificate of practically anybody without you proving that you had a right to that document. And so when, when, yep. when we had that, okay, about face, come back to Moscow, get ready. We, we, we're going we're gonna to launch you soon. So n now I had to work on a backstory. Were you Jewish? I was half Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> because the, fa the father's name is a Jewish name. Um, right. and, and the mother's name could be German, Schwartz. Right. And that helped also with explaining when some people say, you have a bit of an accent. I say, well, I, I grew up yeah. bilingual. And that, that, yeah. that, worked, yeah. that, that shut people up in New York for sure. <laughs> and so um, Jack Barsky was born in 44, and I arrived in the United States in 78. So I was already uh, 34, right? And so what did I do in those 34 years? So we had to get this covered. I, I don't want to. I, I don't know if you want the details, but uh, let let's just say uh, uh, we had me on a farm for a long time. Okay, okay. and and, right. um, and yep. somewhere in, in, in rural upstate New York, uh, because I was suffering from migraine headaches and I I couldn't stay in the city. I was I was born in 
uh, in New Jersey and then went to school in, in New York. And then eventually, mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I, and my mother passed away. That's when I got the headache, you know, like my father pa passed away very early. And, um, <clears throat> and it, that, you know, I, this was a very well thought out uh, uh, co cover story. Uh, and particularly, I'm very proud of the fact that I took a lot of my German contacts with me. <clears throat> I just renamed them. Like my first grade teacher, yeah. I, somebody asked me, you know, what, what was your first grade teacher like? I could describe the, the lady. And even even yeah. my first girlfriend, my first sexual experience and all that, you know, that I had all, all this was part of my life. So it was pretty good. And um, and so the, spent maybe another six weeks in Moscow and then off I went. Um, <clears throat> I uh, I had with me, I was dressed in in West German clothes. Um, I had a false West German passport. Um, mm -hmm. I had one suitcase that had some extra clothes and it also had a shortwave radio. Uh, the Barsky certi birth certificate was in a, in a uh, secret compartment in a carry-on um, and $10,000 in cash. So what was the route in? What was the route into the U.S.? Which way did you go? Oh, it, it was the the most complicated trip in my entire life. So we wound up we wound up in in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, the the in hindsight, I figured wh why they uh, made the trip that way. We this was a somewhat friendly country. It was a communist country. Yep. And then from a somewhat friendly country, I went to a neutral country, Vienna, Austria. Uh, from a neutral country, okay. I went to uh, a NATO country. Uh, and then from there, that was uh, uh, Italy. And from Italy, I took a plane to Mexico City simply because they figured, um, you know, I shouldn't arrive in the United States jet lagged. You know, I, I spent a week in Mexico City. And then, and that, that I just found out a couple of days ago when... When somebody shared something with me that I, I, for the life of me, I did not understand because they didn't tell me any of that. Why they had me go through Chicago. I, I bought a ticket on American Airlines that uh, went to my hometown. I was now traveling with a Canadian passport. I, I bought a ticket yeah. to, to Toronto and with a stopover in Chicago. And that's where I stayed. Uh -huh. Now, now I think I know why they had to go through um, uh, Chicago. Literally, I had only one question. So, yeah, you live in Toronto. What what, do you, what are your plans to do here? So I just want to take a look at what Chicago is like. That was all. <laughs> now, I was prepared for a whole lot more. And and I, I would have failed an aggressive interview, no no matter how skilled and how, how good my backstory. It wouldn't have held up. That was... That really? was the second time I should have failed. So I just out of interest now, so everyone's listening to this. Very different life you're pursuing. Paranoia? No. Fear? None. Why? Because I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't wired to operate on fear. There's two things. You know, this it's the vi the wiring. You know, the I did a lot of things. I did, took a lot of risk, even risk even as a child. I would climb trees that that you shouldn't have climbed, and you know, be on a on a branch that broke off and fall down and get injured, and then I do it again. And and right. but the other thing, as I you know went through high school and college, and then the training in the KGB, and everything I touched, I was pretty much the best at it, and so I developed a very natural optimism that no matter what everything will be all right and on top of it you know i um i told you i i, they, I was aware of the chance of going to jail but, but what what the kgb shared with me they said the worst thing that they can do to you they're going to put you in jail and they may slap you around a little bit but uh american jails are much nicer than ours and and we will get you out and it Clearly, there, yeah, there, okay, right. there was evidence that they were doing this. They, 
the, yeah. and and the, the, that was also partially based on their self interest because if if you abandon your agents, pretty soon you can't recruit anybody anymore. There was no reason to to I'm, I'm fundamentally wired to, to not have fear and and all the other circumstances actually made me literally fearless. I I was more afraid of my ex wife than I was. Uh, to to be a, <laughs> an illegal in the United States. What was the task? At the end of the day, what what were you set out to do? The task that they gave me was was the only one that I knew. And what they were telling me, first of all, the first one I knew was establish yourself as an American and and, and acquire uh, the right documents that will make you an American. The birth certificate wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. Now you could get on a plane those days. You didn't have to show anything. You uh, at a hotel. Yes. Most most hotels wouldn't ask you for anything either. Um, yep. But um, you know, in order to become an American, I had to have a, an an identity document, and there was, and it still is today, a driver's license of the state where you live. Um, and then, in order to have a job, uh, you had to have a social security card. And yeah. and those documents were we were focused on those, and then when I had all 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 of those, go for a passport after you have a job, okay, and this is where the the idea of becoming rich actually could have become reality because the whole idea was with that passport uh, relocate to a European country that speaks German, Austria or Switzerland, and open up a business. And the KGB had plans to funnel a bun- bunch of money into that uh, business. And within a couple of years, I can repatriate that money, show up in in, uh, in the U- United States, uh, move to Washington, yeah. D.C., and um, join a country club that is next to the Pentagon or closest to the Pentagon. I would have, I would have been an, yes. an incredibly dangerous agent that way because I... That would have set me up to mingle with people, the so-called ruling class, the rich, the the government officials, yep. and so forth. Well, yep. they I failed to get the passport. That was the third mm-hmm. time I should have been busted. Um, if, and this is, you know, you're laughing, and I'm laughing about it too because I made a real that that, that was based on a mistake that I made. Um, I was advised to go to the passport office in person. That yes. was bad advice. I don't know why they why they made me do that. I could have asked for a passport via the mail. So I I showed up with my driver's license, with my birth certificate, and the filled out application. So the the clerk took it all, and I went back to wait a little bit, and then he waved me uh, to to his counter. And um, so here I got to tell you where the mistake was. Um, the uh, application had a number of questions, you know, that had to do with the, when you were born, you know, where you live and all that address. Mm-hmm. And then one question, what do you do for work? That was mandatory. And another question, uh, what are your travel plans and when are you going there? That was optional. So, and this this is the really bad mistake I made. I honestly wrote Messenger because at the time I worked as a bike messenger. Um, okay. But right. nobody, I, if I write bike messenger, that was probably still not good enough because nobody knew that bike messengers were paid on commission. I got half of what they, what the company got, which was a decent living. I could live independently. I didn't need any money from the KGB anymore. Okay. Now I wrote messenger mm-hmm. and then I didn't, I left blank the fields where, where I was going and, and, uh, when, when I planned to go. So this fella, you know, was reasonably sharp. He said, wait a minute, here's a, here's a messenger who makes minimum wage. And he doesn't know where he's going. And when he's going there, what does he need a passport for? So that's when he called me and he said, and he said that one sentence that, um, yes, thank God I'm a stoic and I, I don't, when, when bad news comes at me, I usually make 
don't make any uh, facial expressions. So he said, right. well, there's some, there's some doubt about your identity. Could you just please fill out this additional questionnaire? So I go to the back and, uh, at a desk and start looking at the questionnaire. And the first question I knew I was, I was dead because the question was, where, went you go, where, where did you go to high school? There was no record of Jack Barsky ever having gone to the high school that I, I knew by name that was in my back story. So whatever else I could answer without b being traced back to, you know, not, not being true, I, I, I was dead. Yeah. So I, and this is where my quick decision-making capability uh, saved my ass. I went back to the, uh, without thinking, I went back to the counter and I started mumbling and then I started cursing out loud and I told him, I don't need this shit here, you know, you, you're bugging me. And I grabbed the document that was still in front of him and walked out. Now, the, the lucky Smart. part of this is, assuming that the guy remembered my name, he, he forgot to tell the authorities. And maybe he didn't remember my name because, again, I should have been busted. So that's number three. <laughs> <laughs> the Keystone Cops of, 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 of espionage. So how many other illegals do you think were in the States at the time? Uh, well, I, I, I do know, and this is information that came directly out of the KGB archives, which uh, was smuggled out by an archivist who, who, who copied a lot of notes, handwritten notes over the years and, and wound up uh, giving them to MI6. So this is, this is verified okay. information that, and um, mm -hmm. and in the late seventies to mid eighties, they trained ten of us, exactly ten. Uh, I know what happened to one of them. He wound up in New York like me, and um, yeah. um, he had no task. He had the only task that he had was to just live in the United States as an American. What? So just to watch and understand how Americans think. And I'm I'm going to explain now. What the task, the major task for me was, was exactly that, except they didn't tell me that. And, and according to a friend of mine who used to be counterintelligence FBI, he is not aware that any other illegal had tasks like me, because they did give me some tasks. And, and, and that was probably the reason that <clears throat> I, I must have been a standout, because everybody else, was lived, whoever was there, lived like an American. Nothing else. The reason that it was important to them is you know during the height of the Cold War there was uh, there was a possibility that uh, uh, the U.S. and the United uh, and, and and the Soviet Union would break break off diplomatic relations. In which case, okay. right. because most, if not all, the KGB spies were diplomats at the UN and in in Washington D.C. and and we would be the only ones left over. Now, yeah. I wasn't told this, and I was not given any instructions as to what would have to be done in that uh, kind of an emergency, but they certainly would have given us something to do. And that something probably would have been rather dangerous. Was the task always to be there for a long period of time? There was a hint that uh, they, it was not explicit, made explicit, but uh, I was under the impression that uh, we were looking at a 10 year time frame. There, there, there was talk about me eventually going back home, but not leaving the KGB. But you know, doing some, you know, some short, short-term uh, uh, tasks. You know, courier or maybe, maybe specific recruitment or something like that. But not establishing yourself as a resident agent. Um, and and that sort of makes sense because hmm. they must have known, or at least guessed that if I was really uh, successful at the task to become an American, I eventually would become an American. And that is the, yeah. the truth. But it wasn't within yeah. 10 years. It took a little longer. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, I successfully became an American. So, so that was um, roughly the 10-year the, uh, the time frame. But when they called me back 
in, in, when they figured there was an emergency situation, they thought the FBI was actually working my case and the case for every illegal, but then because my friend, my colleague, was also called back at the same time. So when, when they called me back... Who gave you away? Or how were you picked up with the FBI and figured you, figured you out? So I was just telling you that they were already past the, the 10 year limit. We, it was already 10 years and three months. And there was no indication that <clears throat> I would go back in a you know, non emergency situation. So they, I was actually too valuable. And they had also given me a task to, to collect the, some, some technology, buy some technology and, and give it the stuff that was on the do not trade list that, that couldn't be uh, sold to uh, communist nations. I couldn't find any hardware, but I stole some software because I had I had access to original software uh, when I was working at MetLife. The, 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 security, the security precautions were non-existent. <laughs> okay. Because you'd built yourself a career in technology yeah, after yeah. Right, finishing right. college. That's right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So you're doing that in 10 years, what, three months? And yeah. They're, they're saying, come back. Bam. Um, it was, uh, we had a, uh, a signal system. There was a, uh, I had to tell the KGB the route I would take going to work. And it was a, roughly about a 10 minute walk to a subway station. And the, the, the signal spot was a steel beam supporting the elevated portion of the A train that went to Manhattan. And this is one, it was still like pretty dark. It was in December, mid middle of December. You know, I, I make my way to, I'm still a little bit uh, sleepy. It was maybe you know, seven in the morning or 6.45. And, and routinely I look at that spot and bam! That the, the, the thought that popped into my head, and uh, sorry for the curse word, but it, it makes it clear what, how it hit me. I say, oh, shit. Well, that was totally unexpected because, you know, all this, the, the uh, things that I did to, uh, to find out whether somebody was actually investigating me indicated there was no danger. And again, I had some really clever things that, for instance, I, I, I would have known if somebody had um, gone, gone through my uh, apartment, guaranteed. There's, because I had a, a drawer that had an overhang. It wasn't, it wasn't flat. You couldn't see from, from, from above that there was a little gap when it was closed. And if you open the drawer and you, don't, did, you didn't close it exactly to have that gap at eight millimeters, I knew you were there. And I think even the even the, the best uh, searchers would not be able to find that. And there, I also placed a radio and at a certain distance from the from the edge of the. Somebody may have just like looked at the radio and stuff like that, and and I knew the the frequency exactly that that I had dialed in. So anyway, no sign whatsoever. So I just like I went numb for a while, but my my stoic self took over, and I went. Uh, I, I went to work. Uh, I couldn't. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. What did you see at the subway station? Oh, oh, it was a, it was a pretty big red dot, the size of my fist, that was screaming at me. That was the emergency signal. By the KGB. Yeah, somebody, so some, somebody, somebody the went there at night uh, and put that signal there. Yep, and it must have been really late at night because. Um, you know, th there was a lot of traffic in that area, and th it must have been when uh, in between trains where there were, were no trains coming, like for 20, 30 minutes. Poor guy. I don't even know. Uh, I, I don't remember how high up it was, but it must have been reachable uh, f from a person without a ladder or a footstool or something like that. So that signal says what? Time to return? Activate emergency procedure. I had, uh, we had a, a pre. Prearranged emergency procedure. Um, I, I at one point they had given me in a dead drop operation a bunch of uh, I don't know if they were real or forged uh, two Canadian uh, uh, documents, a birth certificate and a driver's license. And I I hid this in a, 
special location in a park uh, in, in the Bronx, north of uh, Manhattan. And the uh, the uh, and I also had uh, uh, done some reconnaissance to see how easy it was to cross from. Uh, from the United States side of uh, the Niagara Falls on a bridge on foot to the Canadian side. And I found out, mm -hmm. you know, you can go there and nobody would ask for identification. So it was really easy to do. So it, the whole plan was go get the, get the documents just in case you need them and then just make, it, make a beeline to the border and show up in Ottawa in the Soviet embassy, and uh, we will get you out. We will you know, provide you with documentations, and you can get on a plane and fly back home. Okay. Well, I didn't do it. I went to work. And the reason I went to work is not because I was, uh, I was frozen. I, I actually was frozen, but for a good reason. Because and there's one thing that they didn't know. If they had known this... Uh, uh, I would have been in trouble, period, a big trouble, because I, at, this, at that point, I lived with a woman who I had married to provide her with a green card and eventual citizenship. She was from South America. And a child, 18 months, she um, got pregnant on purpose. Your, your child? To keep me. Okay, right. So I am now very grateful okay. that she did. But I was really pissed off. Yep. But I, you know, um, I did the right thing um, morally. I supported the child and eventually I found a flat in an apartment where we could live so somewhat separately. So when, when I did my spy stuff, I was far away and I told her not to disturb me and she never did. So you hadn't told HQ this is taking not, place? Not at all. You hadn't I, told Moscow. I kept two secrets from them. Uh, the, the first one was that I graduated as valedictorian. They would have they would have busted my chops over that because I wasn't supposed to, you know. I was be... just drawing limelight on yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that was it. A... But you're supposed to be the gray man, not the man in the white exactly. suit. Exactly. That that's a, that's another dumb mistake I made based on my ambition. <laughs> and and oh, by the way, I negotiated two B's. To become A's as well, so, <laughs> <laughs> and and that ambition just ran away with me. And and the, well, did you have to give the, did you have to give the valedictorian speech as well? Yes, at Madison Square Garden in front of four thousand people. I should have, I should have. Gee, mate, you you really hide the you really hide the crowd. Yeah, <laughs> I think about it. Uh, uh, I was ten years older than than the average graduate, and I spoke with a touch of an accent. Some people <laughs> must have heard that. And nobody, nobody uh, came to me afterwards and says, "Hey, listen, you know, this is interesting. You, how, how did you manage to, to, to do what you did? And where are you coming from?" I, I should have been busted again. Dumb luck. Nobody talked to me. So, and I, and I didn't tell them that. And and the fact that they didn't find out, it was a, it was a public. They knew that I attended that college, and. There was some public notice that you know there would be this event at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> they didn't know. They they never. I knew for a fact, and they, and it, it made sense. They never checked on me. They they relied. They had only information about me that uh, that I gave them because yeah, again, right. if they checked on me, they it's like when you touch a little an end of a spider's web, the, the spider at the other end will notice, and the spider would be counterintelligence. Because they they pretty much knew who was KGB, and they you know they would they would follow them they would investigate them. They would, so so hey, I, when, I I know that Jack. Was I, ask you thing. Go ahead. When you're living this life, are you more worried about the CIA or the FBI over the KGB, or you're more worried about the KGB than the FBI and the CIA? I didn't get worried uh, about the KGB until uh, I told them that uh, I. Uh, that I couldn't, wouldn't come. And I didn't know oh. how they would respond to that. Other than that, uh, the KGB was still my best friend. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and and, okay. and, and, and um, up until are you still my- a pa Are you still a patriot by this time? Uh, or are you starting to, patriot, you starting to yes, lose but faith? But not, not, not necessarily a, a flaming communist. I, I had morphed into like, um, I had morphed my ideology into socialism, which was still preferable to capitalism. As I experienced it in in the U.S., and there was a, uh, a theory that was developed by European so social democrat parties, 
it was called convergence theory. And I kind of liked that. And it's like, you know, the good elements of socialism and, and capitalism yep. converging, making, yep. making, you know, making the, the result a, a, a wealth generating uh, machine that then could be shared equally with everybody. And I okay. like that. I like this a lot because I knew that uh, communism was uh, um, ineffective, inefficient, and and not capable of creating enough wealth to to uh, distribute it equally. But I right. still like the you know the the idea that you know a ruling elite would govern and you know make sure that everybody is treated well uh, and you know i was going to be part of the that, that elite so i was still sort of a patriot and a socialist okay so during the other part of the life you've moved on from college and you've built this career in technology and you were starting to work with major corporates weren't you oh uh, yes and you've done well and you've done well in, in the personal in the, in the in the actual business life as well haven't you not you know i spent 10 years as a as a hands-on programmer and and I loved it, yeah. and I was really, really good at it. You know, I, I, this this really uh, was much more interesting to me at that point than you know the spy stuff. You know, because for the first time in many years, I was able to do something creative. You know, consistently mm -hmm. creative, and and also get feedback when when you did a good job because you can't lie to, to the computer; it'll it'll crash. And and I I I had lots and lots of good feedback, and it was in a in a company that uh, an insurance company that felt a little bit like back home, because they were very paternalistic. They we had free lunch, and you could have free breakfast and dinner, and uh, and and they and they right. pretty much wow. guaranteed you a job for life, and and. The people were very nice. Uh, I was treated mm -hmm. well, and mm -hmm. and my colleagues were all like smart people. So all of a sudden, you know, even even the student community, most of them weren't that smart. But but you know, you couldn't be a hands-on programmer in those days and, and be an idiot. Uh, so it, it was a nice environment for me, and and I loved it. And you know, at one point before they called me home there was like maybe i was on that job for four or five years um i was thinking to myself man i'm gonna miss these people i'm gonna miss this job yeah hold on, hold on, hold on. okay i understand that that's right that's very kind of you to say that and you're settling in and you've got a great job and they're really nice paternalistic people end of the day aren't you there to bring down the country in some form or another if i could contribute to the motherland you know what um there the the what this was an involved dichotomy play? that I uh, didn't feel comfortably thinking about. So what do you do? You put it in the back, the back recess of the mind, or what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, in den I was totally in denial. You know, if I had, if if I had an interviewer like you, who had would have interviewed me in, in those days, they would have pulled this out of me. But you know, there's some things that you just don't, don't want to face. You're supposed to be a good spy, Jack. You know, why create a dilemma in your mind when when you can suppress the thought? But people are wired that way. There's a lot of people in, that I know that that cannot admit when they when they made a mistake. Yeah, 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 for sure. For okay, sure. and that was a mistake. I was part of it, but generally, when I make mistakes, I I learn to admit them to myself and to everybody who. Who has an interest All in right, it. so with but the it, dichotomy, you've got one part of called process of the job. So I'm sitting there and I'm typing away at my, my computer, or the Big Mac or what it was in those days. No, right? no, no, it was, it was, um, it was a, a terminal. We had, oh, the old we, terminals. We, okay, all yeah, right. Yeah, and we got PCs, uh, to, uh, you know, a few, a few years into it, uh, but initially it was all uh, remote terminals to a mainframe. Okay, and you're getting paid and you're doing well and you've got friends, etc. right. You then go home at night. Do you tap away or do you write your, your covert letters? Yeah, letters. And I, and I and I no, I, I didn't tap. You know, I did not. I was not taught how to how to. Gen I didn't do Morse code. No, it's too dangerous again because you know where it comes from. Yeah, okay. Uh, receiving Morse yeah. code, it's not directional. You you don't know who receives. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, um, okay. 
So what are you writing about? Are you writing about what the Americans are thinking? Carter then goes. And then the United States changes dramatically. Reagan comes in. Thatcher comes to power. If I'm the Russians, I want to know what's going on, don't I? What Americans thinking? Oh, oh yeah. We is that your role to keep me informed of that and make sure my view is accurate? You're absolutely right. Um, to the extent I could, but I knew that um, the the leadership of the Soviet Union was convinced, and so was the KGB, that Reagan would eventually start a war. Really? And one of the tasks I had was to periodically check on a on a military installation, a a, a navy uh, installation uh, by at the coast uh, down in New Jersey to see. I had some training and in, in observation and and recognizing uh, what kinds of ships I'm looking at from a distance based on a silhouette and photography as well. No, 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 nothing like that. Just, just. Just see okay. if, if, the, if there are signs for preparation for war. And, uh, you know, there were a couple of situations uh, towards the end of the, the war and Reagan was president when, when we got really close based on misunderstandings. Uh, and there was one instance when, when a Soviet submarine, and the, the U.S. didn't know it then, uh, was forced to emerge by a deep charge uh, they, yeah. they were on near on the coast uh, coast of Cuba, and it was a nuke. And uh, the um, uh, the protocol was there were three officers, and they all three would have uh, would have to agree that it was okay to fire a nuke. Well, two of them said yes, and the the, the top guy said no. He saved the world. Well, what what were they, what was the target? New York. Yeah, it would have would have been. Yep, and they had they, they they were within reach, and then there was this other thing where there was NATO had a had a maneuver called Able Archer, and um, the the KGB leadership was was convinced that this was this was preparation for actual war, but we had a, a an officer in the Soviet Army who told the CIA to back the heck off. Or else, we'll shoot. Right. So really? you know there were there were a couple of these situations that were very dangerous, um, and and the, the the Soviet and and part of it was because of the paranoia of the Soviet Union. What saved the day was that Andropov got very ill. Yep. Because he was a he was very very you know, what, what you call right wing. He was a he, he was a very. Um, very uh, hostile towards the West, right. very conservative in, with regard to, you know, what that means in, in the Soviet Union. And how they wound up um, appointing Gorbachev mm. is still a mystery to me. But he must have been a really good politician and created a lot of support amongst the Central Committee uh, when they took a vote, he won, and not one of those conservatives. And and he and Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War. And and this is uh, I mean it's first of all it's it, it, prim primarily Reagan is responsible for ending the Cold War because he took a very uh, strong. Aggressive, not warmongering, but aggressive stance, and, and to push the Soviet Union, and and Gorbachev knew that uh, the Soviet economy was was faltering, and he knew that uh, the only way that to to revive it would be to make some make some reforms. You know, the, one of the first uh, things that he decreed was to in, in, uh, increase the uh, price of vodka by like a lot of lot. I mean, when I was in Moscow, a, a, a bottle of Stolichno, uh, Stolichno went for four rubles. That went no, probably what? to 20 because there were a lot of drunkards on the streets. So, yeah. and, uh, and somehow they, they had, uh, they reached out through intermediaries and they met, they got along very well. And, uh, that was, 
initially the end of the wall, and that eventually became the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, but but um, in, in at least the p possibility of a nuclear war was diffused phenomenally. I mean that that risk was lower when when they, they were done with their negotiations than it is now. It's funny, but that was the end of that era and the beginning yep. of a man called Putin and the beginning of the man called Putin. Yep. Were you gonna were you gonna be out of a job then? Ah you know, uh, the my colleague who was called back at the same time I was called back, they yeah. offered him a job. They said, you know, um, I understand, you know, with the wall came uh, when when the wall came down, they decided to quit. Yeah. Uh, and so okay. they, they showed up at headquarters in, in Moscow and they said, you know, we were done, you know, we're going back to Germany. And they offered him a job. And they said, you know, you pick your country. That and and if you if you operated as an illegal in in another country and, and then the Soviet Union falls apart, I think they would have liked to keep you there. Yeah. Okay. okay. There, yep. there's, there's a. I mean, there's the the heritage of the KGB was fundamentally the staff stayed pretty much the same, except for those agents who joined the Russian mafia. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> and some of them yeah, became okay. politicians and oligarchs. Okay. Jack, during your your period when you built your corporate career, and you're still paralleling this this other life, I don't know how much you can say, but where do you think you were most successful as a as an agent? I know you might have been living there for ten years. You survived all that, but what do you think? What intel or insights do you think you best gave Moscow? No, no direct intelligence that uh, that I was able to provide, other than the, uh, the 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 source code that I stole, yeah, okay, and the the hints of people who might be val valuable to. Um, to take a look at uh, possibly as a recruit. And I had a couple of uh, tasks that uh, required mobility. Um, they One time they had me go to San Bernardino and um, find out whether uh, a, a certain Nikolai Koklov still lived there and, uh, and, and taught at the University of California, um, San Bernardino. The, the reason that they sent me, because the the diplomats were limited to a 50-mile radius around New York uh, uh, and um, Washington, D.C., they, they would have to ask for permission to travel outside of, the, of, of that, that area. So it was easier to save me. I could go any place. I also, when I was in Canada, they also sent me to to a Canadian town to check on somebody. So. But anyway, so I found the fellow, and this is just too delicious not to talk about. So he was in the phone book, so I could I could even take a look at the, the house where he lived. But now I also wanted to find out: Does he still teach? Yeah, right. You know, how do you find? How do you go about that? You know, again, there was no googling the, uh, the university, so that, that this wasn't public knowledge. So I went on the campus. And I was walking around, and in one of the hallway, I'm getting to the very end of the hallway, and uh, there's a sign on the on the door. It says Professor Kakloff, teaching psychology. Oh, I'm looking at this, and I says, "Wow!" And as I'm staring at that that uh, nameplate, the door opens, and some fellow comes out. A few months, no, maybe weeks, weeks later, I was watching late night television, and that very guy was was giving given an interview, and he confided, I don't know if the was the first time he he, um, he admitted it that he at one point was a member of the KGB and he, he defected. Aha! So this what the delicious aspect of all of this is. Uh, there was a moment, and and I found later, much later, that he was uh, in absentia. He was uh, convicted to death. As we say, was he there to be taken out? Yeah, right. The reason that they sent me there, they must have had some plans that they eventually dropped. 
because he 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 died a uh, natural death. But yeah. there was this delicious moment where yep. an active KGB agent is looking in the eyes of a defector who was uh, convicted to death without either one knowing it. <laughs> he didn't know, and I didn't know at that time. Uh, yeah, so right. um, you know, there, there's there all these weird moments uh, in in my life that that couldn't have happened if I had um, chose the the profession of a chemistry professor. Psychologically, how you balance it? Was it just one big game? You know, I, I told you that there came a point where that spy stuff got on my nerves for two reasons. Well, okay, so when you when you have a job in information technology and you're good at what you're doing. You work more than eight hours. You know, you you ha you work overtime. You work weekends uh, because you like what you're doing and you're good at it. And 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 that also gets you promoted and gets you more money. And th and there were night calls, so I, that that spy stuff just like really got on my nerves. You know, and 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 I was also under the impression that I had failed at my mission. I didn't, I, because they never told me what was really important and they never told me anything of what they appreciated. Mm -hmm. Now, there was mitigating circumstances because in my ninth year, I had been decorated, given the decoration, the Order of the Red Banner, which was handed out by the Central Committee of the, the party, the uh, so um, the highest levels of where, where does the order of the red banner stand, Jack? Is it's that... the second highest. It comes after the hero of the Soviet Union. Okay. And another I I irony here that was um, that uh, was accompanied by ten thousand dollars. Now here's the irony: is here's a, an organization <laughs> that wants to defeat the country that. You, the, whose currency you use to, uh, to to praise give praise to one of your agents? <laughs> that you know, well, they knew we couldn't do anything with stupid rubles. You know, there, there yeah. wasn't much you could buy in Moscow. <laughs> and and at the time, I was you know I I also uh, su suppressed thinking about this irony. This is all stuff that when I was able to like honestly look back at my life and come come to terms with who I was, what I thought, what I didn't think. So because I, I needed to come clean with myself, you know, I I, I did I didn't want to have anything hidden left in me in me. I just said mich, that's German. Um that's like an absolution, isn't it? Sure. And and also um you know, if you want run around with buried thoughts and buried thinking, uh, th yeah. that's that's a recipe for being miserable. And I'm not miserable. All right. So if I gave you a phone call tomorrow and said, "Get look, it's what is it? The FSB now, not the KGB." Yeah. All right, Jack. I've got a great job for you. Before you call it a day, I want you to come in and run the uh, the next program for us at the FSB. Uh. Yeah, no, you if wouldn't. You, I know you wouldn't. If but you if I offer did me a hundred, if you offer me a hundred million, I wouldn't do it. You know, I I never did it for money. No, but the question I'm asking you is this: If you're going to give advice now about the the functionality and performance, is ten years too long as a sleeper? Is it too long to put some? Because aren't you you're you're starting to unravel, aren't you? Near the end, you're oh, losing sight. Well, so, I'm 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 I'm, I'm inching towards the end, but the end really was uh, provided by the love for my daughter. Uh, so it was still a personal decision, but you, you know, you, I'm inching towards the end. Yeah. It, let's say Trinity, let's for argument's sake, Trinity is not in my life. And the Soviet Union goes yep. down. Yep. And the Russians say, come on over. You know, it w I'm thinking it, it would have been almost a forced because I couldn't go back to Germany and I knew that they would have invited me to go live in Russia and I had discussed this with my German wife and she would have been open to that as well. Now how do you just open up there a little bit? The audience doesn't know about the German wife. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're a secret agent. You're a secret guy as well, right? Yeah, so what's, well, what's you know, I here? also, 
I also was a bigamist, and, and I was never punished for that because nobody knew, only me. You know, I was married in Germany. Uh, I, I loved my German wife. I, I loved her even when I decided uh, that I wouldn't go back to Germany. And I didn't love the American wife. I, I married her because uh, I had pity on her. She, she was illegal in the United States and had at one point paid somebody to marry her and then apply for a green card. And that, that guy took the money and ran. So, and you know, she was, she was a good companion. She was very safe. She couldn't have possibly known that, that I'm not really a true American. And she was very pretty. And you know, I was a young man. I had my, my male needs, so to speak. And, and she, 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 I mean, she was pretty much perfect. So I wanted to keep her. I said, all right, so I'm going to marry you. But listen, I'm not, I, I'm not the marrying kind. I will, uh, when, when you have your green card, we'll get divorced. And she said, yes. And, and then she, you know, she decided that she wants to stay married. And so she, she got pregnant. Ah, okay. And, and that's how I became a father. Right. And so I watched this child, Chelsea, grow up. I did never watch my son Matthias grow yeah. up. I met him a couple of times when I went back there, but, but they, we, we, didn't have a father-son relationship. You know, I, I took some presents and, uh, and one time, you know, he called me uncle. But that's, that's um, when you, when you, uh, when there's a friendly stranger, it doesn't have to be yeah, your uncle, yeah, it's just what Germans say, yeah, uncle. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, um, and I, the, the dual personality that I had uh, developed for me to operate in, in that way. So I was, when I was in Germany, I was the German guy again. When I, when, when I came back to the United States, I was uh, Jack Barsky. And, and that dual personality sa saved me from, from feeling guilty about this, you know, the, the two women. Uh, I, I certainly don't feel good about it now, but um, it's an explanation, it's not an excuse. But you know, how, this this kind of secret life mm -hmm. where you're supposed to be living supposed to live a normal life almost forces you to do these yeah. things you know you know if i'd stayed single and hadn't dated uh, anybody i would have been a freakish asexual person right. right yep i understand i understand so let's get back to you see the red mark on the wall you you now got to go home right you weren't coming home as I said, I'm going, I'm going to work. And, and I, I was, my brain was not functional. I, I stared at the computer screen, but I didn't work because, you know, fundamentally I was in, in a, in a brain freeze. The brain was working, but it was going round and round and round. What do I do? What do I do? Because I, um, I had unbeknownst to me, I had fallen in love with this little girl. Ha. And uh, that is the moment in my life that changed everything. When, uh, be because um, it, more so, more more than just me eventually becoming an American, but I actually joined the human race. Last one. Uh, because you know the, what, what I had was unconditional love, mm -hmm. and up up until that point, I didn't know how to love, and I you know I was mo more or less in love with myself. The the ladies that I dated in, uh, in the U.S. I I didn't love and and even uh, and, uh, and another my my German wife I loved her but I also wanted something back you know this what this little girl could give me back was a smile yeah right and I just I I I dreaded the thought her mother had four four years of of uh, schooling she she spent four years in, in a classroom no more. She could read and she could read and write, but not a whole lot more. And so, if I leave, that girl will grow up in poverty, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that I can ask the KGB to help the, that that uh, uh, you know to, to to funnel some money to that little family, because I would have had to admit 
that I had gotten some somebody pregnant. And then they would have found out that at one point we were married. So punishment would have would have been uh, dealt, I guarantee you. So I, I was I was really frozen. What do I do? If if I go to back to Russia, Germany, uh, this girl will have a bad life. If I stay, there's like the possibility that they're right and they can, and I go to jail. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also the possibility, that how, whatever I tell them, if I if I don't go, I need to come up with an explanation. If they don't believe it, they might. I knew that they. That is something I knew that they were not very nice to defectors. Wouldn't they shut down the asset? You know, you're a liability if you're not coming home. Yeah, but they they could. They also had they also had a track record of assassinating defectors. Yeah, the, the, when you oh shut down. What, what do you mean yeah. by that? Okay, yes. And 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 other and the other thing is you know, joining the human race. I my decision eventually to stay was entirely unselfish. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because was whatever whatever was good for me was over there. The wall, the the, the Berlin Wall hadn't come down yet. I had no clue that this will all collapse. Uh, and I had I had a lot of dollar savings. And, uh, you know, I would have gone back as a conquering hero and rejoined the woman I still love. So there, there's a moment where, uh, you know, I went back and forth, back and forth. And I, you know, eventually I had to make a decision because they, they did something that was um, uh, unusual because I, I didn't, they, they asked me to acknowledge uh, through a signal that I, you know, got got the information, and and I'm um, I'm going, and expect me in Canada. So, um, and I didn't acknowledge that there was a radio transmission, mm-hmm. and uh, eventually they thought they got to figure out if I'm still around. So they knew how I went to work. So one day, one of the agents just. Uh, uh, it was um, another dark morning. There weren't too many people on the platform. He just uh, came from my right side and and came really close and whispered into my ears, you got to come home or else you're dead. And that was uh, with a rather heavy uh, Russian accent. So on the one hand, this could have been wrong words. Maybe he wanted to say, or else you, you, you're, you're going to be in big trouble here. <laughs> Or something like that. No, you're dead. <laughs> Pretty simple. So, but, but it was it was spoken by a KGB agent. You have to take it somewhat seriously, and that's when I had to make a decision. But I still didn't make it. Actually, there was a Monday. The following Thursday, there was a radio transmission, which I listened to, and uh, they um, uh, called me to a dead drop operation where I was going to get uh, uh, money and. Uh, passport right to travel to Canada so that the fact that I went to I, I agreed to that operation didn't mean I made a decision already because I just wanted to make sure that I, that I get the money yeah, right buying time yeah and but not a whole lot anymore so and and what happened then uh, you, you know I used to be in the habit and I don't, I, I don't fundamentally don't do it anymore when when there's a big decision to be made the good stuff on the left bad stuff on the right and then my analytical self uh, signs uh, uh, weights numbers you add them up and whichever side wins that's what you you do that didn't work because everything good was on the left side everything good was back there so but i still couldn't make that decision so I went to the dead drop operation. It was, um, and for some reason, it was in the dark. And uh, without get, getting too much into detail, that spot where they were supposed to put the container with a, uh, a crushed oil can they used all the time uh, uh, that, that contained the passport and the, uh, and the money, uh, that, that spot was very easy to find. Uh, it, uh, I mean... It was a no-brainer. It was a couple of hundred feet into a park where there was a big tree that had fallen, and it had a it had a, a, a an opening where 
that container was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and I, I knew this like the back of my hand. Yeah. And the protocol was such that the person who puts the container in, in, in its location would set a signal someplace, mm -hmm. you know, a little, little chalk mark on a, on, a, on a light pole. And I passed that light pole, and yes, there's the chalk, uh, the, the chalk mark. And uh, so I go on. I had a flashlight, and it was really very safe because there was nobody in, in the park in, 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 in December mm -hmm. in the evening, right? So I get to the spot. I see the, the, the hollow tree. There's no oil can. This is a shock because it should be there. So I'm like walk around a little bit and, and, and see if, if it was misplaced or, um, and I spent a good 15, 20 minutes and then I gave up. And as I leave the park, my brain made the decision. It said to me, I'm staying. Now that happens to me frequently. Anyway, that was the decision and I, I stuck to it. Risk or no risk, you know, this, this was it. And, um, I, um, wrote the goodbye letter to the KGB. And people asked, how do you resign from the KGB? But because in the goodbye letter, I told them I, I am not defecting. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not betraying, uh, the GDR or the Soviet Union or our cause, but I, I'm, I'm forced to stay here because I, I have HIV AIDS. And that was, in those days, was a death sentence. Yep. And I had some reason to believe that they might actually buy this because of my track record of, even when I was working with Herman, I would occasionally volunteer when I did something bad, something wrong, when I messed up. So I had the, uh, I had, had, had the rec reputation of being uh, brutally honest. And um, they ha they also had no reason uh, to think that me lying about this age thing and staying would be good for me. You know, the, everything they knew that everything good for me was back there. So there was a good chance that they would buy into this, but I wasn't a hundred percent sure. So I took some precaution. I, I couldn't take a lot of precaution. I couldn't just run. Because I, the reason that I stayed, I was because I was going to stay with my family, right? So um, I, the only thing that I could do, and that was more or less psychological, but I made sure that on my way, my every day, uh, my way to work uh, was a different route, mm -hmm. and I I went at a different time, so I'm not predictably at, in the same spot. Mm -hmm. So you know that that could could have prevented one attempt but you know after after uh three months of that i settled down hey had, had jack had fear kicked in finally in your life no still didn't uh it's look um and i in the book i, dead, I called, dead men dead men I can't talk state. jack as you know right they can't tell stories yeah i know i i was able to 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 numb myself okay and i in the book i call it execution mode when I focus only what I need to do and not think about what could happen. Okay, right. Fair and enough. and I and I recently I I didn't know this, but I found out that I'm quite a stoic. Yeah, right. And and stoics can handle with that can handle adversity very well. No more visitors at the railway station. No. No more men walking past passing no. any more comments. No. Uh, and no more radio transmissions. They stopped. When, when they stopped, I knew that they had gotten my letter. But, you know, after the three months, um, I went back home and I told Penelope, the woman I, I had married, and she had bothered me. She, she wanted to, wanted me to get a house. And I always said, no, we, we, we didn't have the money at the time. But I said to her, okay, we're going to save up one more year and then we move to the suburbs. Okay. And that was a, that was the second significant step to becoming an American, you know. And um, the third step came when the wall came down. So ideologically, I, at that point, 
I didn't, I, I didn't want to think about, uh, you know, what kind of a system uh, system I might be uh, supporting. I was just a, a a private individual who made a good living, and who would take care of his family, and everything else was blocked out again, yep. because okay. you know I wasn't yet, uh, I wasn't now at, at at a point where I said, all right, I'm I'm going to embrace the United States completely and fully. No. So, um, but. You know, move to move to no. Before we moved, actually, I, I I sat in my living room, still in in New York, and I watched with phenomenal surprise the wall coming down. I was as surprised as was the CIA and and the KGB and the Stasi. Nobody saw that coming. And I certainly didn't because I had no clue how well the GDR still functioned and how well it, it didn't. I didn't have a clue about those those uh, marches and the, and the people protesting, demonstrating. Now, yeah. I'm naturally curious, and, and I needed to understand what happened there. And at that time, you know, the Internet already was a very valuable research tool. So I didn't, didn't have to go to the library. I just could type something into a search engine and and out came a whole lot of stuff that showed me with uh, uh, very forcing how what a bad country my my home country was, how bad the Stasi behaved, you know, how many people were prisoners, how many people were killed. There was all incontrovertible evidence and you know i said oh my god one one other thing um i i got to read some some writings by lenin and lenin was growing up and you know operating even as an adult in east germany he was the number one hero he i mean he was like the the god of communism he he sacrificed his health and his life to to help the world to become a better place. So now I'm reading an un, unredacted uh, uh, section because we got re redacted texts. And in that, in one, one section, he was saying, uh, yeah, right. uh, he was telling uh, his folks, we need to uh, execute about 100 kulaks. We should hang him from the trees by the road so everybody knows that, that uh, you know, wealth is very dangerous to, to your life. So I, I paraphrase, and I went, oh, sh you know, the shit work came uh, came out again, and and that this this was against all the morality that I had in me, that was completely misplaced serving communism, and so in a very short period of time, I became as strong an anti-communist as I had been uh, been a communist because I had to admit to myself that I served the devil. And then the, and then the Soviet Union collapsed and more information came out about the KGB. And um, yeah, there was no choice. I wasn't completely American yet, but uh, I, I was going to stay in the United States and, you know, be a private citizen. I still d didn't feel like uh, going to the FBI because I was afraid I would go to jail. And there was a good possibility I would have. So how did you get caught? Okay, so um, unbeknownst to me, of course, uh, it happened in my life uh, quite a bit that there were, when I thought I was in charge of, of my life, that there were people doing something in the background that had an, a significant impact on me. So there was this fellow who uh, had a senior position in the KGB archives. And... Um, he had a son who fell ill, and it was a, uh, a rare illness for which treatment was available only in the West. And he asked if he could take his son to England, and he was permission denied. So he started, uh, he started hating the Soviet state with a vengeance. And he, speaking of vengeance, so he figured out... he. he the only way he could do damage is uh, if you take 
information out of the KGB archives, and he smuggled this yeah, out. He, yeah. he hand, hand wrote on small pieces of paper and smuggled these pieces of paper in his underwear and in his socks over years. And then and he had a dacha, and, and, and he put this all together and, and transcribed this and type wrote it and buried this, piles and piles of paper in his, in, in his dacha. There were supposedly five suitcases worth of uh, printed stuff that uh, mm -hmm. he offered MI6. Uh, the Soviet Union was already gone, but if, if, <laughs> if, if Russian intelligence uh, had gotten wind of it, this guy would have been executed. So mm -hmm. he, he, he went to one of the uh, Baltic countries and went to, uh, to the embassy and they managed to get this stuff out of out of Russia. And your name was on there. My name was in it. Uh, Jack Barsky, illegal uh, um, uh, agent in the northeast of the United States. Well, with that information, there weren't too many Jack Barskys. Mm -hmm. And the one that who got his social security card at the age of thirty-four, that was him. Okay. So, I, and, and unbeknownst to me, they were like. Uh, they didn't know. They they were they all they knew about me where I lived, and that I was a highly trained agent because I had I, I had uh, uh, at the, at that point I had been in the U.S. Unde undetected for sixteen years. Right. And when they finally uh, came came to me and and introduced them, it was nineteen years in my mind. So so they they were concerned. That I might be running an agent in a mole in the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. That that was a time when when there there was like quite a bit of paranoia in the intelligence services because they they there were two very very uh, uh, destructive moles in the U.S. government. The the FBI had Robert Hansen, That's right, yeah. who who was in charge of anti-Russian Soviet operations, and the uh, the CIA had Aldrich Ames. Who was personally responsible for several CIA assets and Russians being killed? Yep. yep. And and both organizations uh, failed to be a little more careful to look at their employees because both of them were engaged in behavior that, that were red flags. Like Ames, for instance, spent money that he didn't have. Yeah, right. And, uh, and, so he, and, and he said, well, the, the money comes out of Brazil because he was married to a Brazilian. But, you know, I, uh, I've been once to a nuclear plant, and they, showed, they, they shared with me uh, how security works at a nuclear plant. They run every employee through a background check uh, every two years. They watch for uh, behavioral changes, like whatever. It could be all kinds of things, changes in pattern. And they even check on, they, they get references on the references that these people provide. Yep. So this is, this is, this is what uh, an agency like uh, like the FBI and the CIA should do, but it's it's like the like the blue wall of silence. You know, all of us, you know, we are all, all one elite group, and uh, it, it, it's not possible that one of us could go rogue. Yeah, right. Well, it it has been shown throughout history that it is possible. Um, uh, um, uh, Hansen did it because he resented. Uh, his treatment. He thought he 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 should be treated better. You know, he he was he was a better agent, and, and he he was miserable. Ames did it for money. So and and so there was this this possibility that um, I was running a mole. So this Russian guy did it for revenge. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So who gets you, who gets the intelligence? The CIA on you or the FBI? The FBI. Okay. What's the, so? What, how do they go about it then? Well, as I told you, they they knew that I was a well trained agent, and and they pretty much knew that the skills that I had acquired, if I use them, I would find out that uh, I'm being investigated. They, right. they they were smart enough to know that, but 
they, what they didn't know that uh, I, I had stopped any any of these measures. None. I was home free. Okay, I, I knew that nobody would find me, but I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought of the idea that somebody would betray me. By the way, mm-hmm. by the way, if this guy were still alive, I would I would reach out to him and uh, and drink a beer with him and get on my knees and thank thank him. It's another irony of my life that the betrayal was actually very good for me. Um, so um, yeah, the FBI initially like. like Stayed away from the spider's web, so to speak. You know, they watched mm-hmm. me from a distance. And when the house next door, I lived in the country in Pennsylvania, when the house next door was uh, on the market, um, they they bought it and moved two agents in there for a while. The idea was to, you know, get a little closer to me. And they thought maybe, just maybe the female agent... Uh, should make contact uh, with uh, Penelope, but they uh-huh. decided not to do it. So they just d- did the visual. They d- they didn't even uh, they didn't even follow me when I went to work. Um, it was all very uh, stealthy. Um, there was a situation where somebody took a photograph of the front yard of the building where I worked. And I was walking around with my friend Gerard Boo, and here's, here comes another interesting wrinkle. Gerard Boo was a, a Cuban immigrant who made very good money. He was a contract worker, and he made twice as much money as me. And so he had bought an apartment that uh, that he had rented out to a Soviet diplomat, and they found that out. Now, alarm bells, FBI. Oh, my God, this is an international spy ring. And uh, so they harassed my friend, and he got really pissed off <laughs> because he had he had nothing to do with the with the Soviet agents. Or anything. But they thought, you know, he was part of that. Uh, and, and then Penelope once traveled to England to visit her uncle. MI5 followed her. <laughs> it was another thought, man, because... The, the the illegal set uh, had a tendency to like marry foreigners and then bring them into the United States. And all of this was pretty much uh, denied to be uh, p- close to the truth by the the lead agent, who spent a lot of time watching me from a distance, uh, about uh, maybe a quarter mile away on a on a hill. He was sitting there with the um, with the binoculars. And and a and a book with pictures of birds, because he was playing like a bird watcher. Yeah, right. And over time, just through body language, uh, he figured that you know me and the wife weren't getting along very well. Right. And uh, there was a lot of tension in our relationship, and uh, and that I loved my children, and I was out playing with them a lot. So he figured, you know. Uh, I uh, I wouldn't run, and I would pro- most likely uh, cooperate because I love my children. Oh, yeah. uh, his boss, a female, still wanted me in jail, but uh, he gathered enough votes amongst uh, amongst his colleagues and, and superiors that they decided to introduce themselves. But they, what triggered the introduction was uh, the following: another bizarre situation. So they had. Uh, done a couple of things that I wasn't aware of. Um, one of them was uh, they would go go through my garbage regularly. They would on a late at night, the uh, the night before the garbage was collected, they would replace my my garbage with other garbage with a same looking can. Okay, so they went through my house very thoroughly. They spent quite a bit of time there because they knew they had the time. And they also installed a listening device <laughs> in the kitchen. Well, obviously, I didn't know that. I wasn't checking for bugs. Um, and one day, my Penelope and I had another argument, and I was so sick and tired of arguing that I figured, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the nuclear option. I, I call it the <laughs> nuclear option now because it was like um, a... 
a very strong approach to trying to figure out. To, she was, um, she was uh, very, very jealous, and she was convinced that I had a lot of affairs with other women. This was triggered by her father leaving the family uh, after having uh, fathered 13 children. All right. And okay. she was the oldest of them, and th th these kids were, were suffering. They were going hungry um, frequently. So she knew that, you know, men, men are just like doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and I tried to convince her by sharing my past. I said, hey, listen, I got I to gotta share something with you that, that should convince you that I am on your side, that I love, I love taking care of you guys. I love, I love Chelsea, and I would never do anything to hurt you. Uh, I used to be a, a Soviet spy, and when they asked me to leave you and leave the United States and go back home, I decided to stay. I took a huge risk because I love you so much. Well, if you can misinterpret something, uh, you can pretty much misinterpret anything. That's, that's a better statement. And she, her interpretation was instinctively, oh my God, I'm married to an ex-spy. Now this guy is a liar through and through, so he really, he's really a bad guy. <laughs> And uh, then she was also scared, you know, mm. what, what, what happens to us now? She, she didn't talk any about this, but um, it truly backfired. And that was fundamentally the end of our marriage. I, eventually, sure. I had to get a divorce. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to share with uh, the listeners or uh, the audience what triggered it. It's, it's, this, is not, this is not the occasion when I should, like, badmouth uh, anybody. So you've said it out loud. Yeah, I said it out loud and not aware that there was somebody in an FBI office listening to my confession. Yeah. <laughs> right. So pretty soon thereafter, they, they arranged a, uh, a situation where they could intercept me, not arrest me. They could have got, if they wanted to arrest me, they could have come to my house, right? Put me in handcuffs and off. No, they, they uh, detained me with the intent to ask for my uh, cooperation. And that required me to not go to an office, not go to my house, but go to a neutral site, and that was a, a motel where they had rented, um, there were two wings, they were at, at a right angle, they rented an entire wing. So not to be disturbed by any, any other people in, 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 in that hallway. And they, they intercepted me at a uh, toll, booth, uh, the crossing, uh, the crossing of, of the Delaware River. Oh, yeah. And they had rented uh, themselves a state trooper to make it more believable. So I'm, oh, yeah. I'm putting my, the, the, the coins in for the toll, and then I'm easing out of the toll booth, and he stands there, and he waves me over and says, um, uh, sorry, sir, uh, this is a routine traffic stop. Could you please step out of the car? And as I'm stepping out, I still had no idea that this would be uh, another life-changing moment. <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this, the lead agent, his name is Joe Riley, um, he uh, came up to me from, from my right, and he flipped open an ID. And I didn't even look at it. I knew right then and there, instinct said, okay, the gig's up. That's the FBI. And he confirmed that he by saying, you know, we're FBI, we would like to have a talk with you. And uh, the feedback that I got, you know, he's now a good friend, and he, he shared a bunch of things that with me that um, what he experienced from his end and what he experienced, he was looking at somebody with a, face that was white as the driven snow because in one this one moment my entire past came back and it, it wasn't it wasn't a really good picture because I already knew that I had committed crimes I already knew that I had served the wrong the wrong uh, cause I mean it was all really shitty <laughs> um and um, so they took me into their vehicle. Um, Riley was driving, and he had a he had a sidekick. Um, they they always do these operations 
oh, there's always two, never only one, because if that something happens, there needs to be another witness. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, his his colleague had uh, I saw a gun strapped to his ankle. So I figured, you know, this is really serious. But you know, here he, he, my stoicism took over within maybe I don't know five minutes. We had barely left the the, the toll bridge area when I uh, asked a question and that was important for me. I asked, "Am I under arrest?" And Riley said, no. Okay. And then my instinct took over. I didn't really came to that, uh, to the conclusion of saying what I said by thinking it through. It just popped into my head, as I told you, it happens to me often. And I said, so what took you so long? And they couldn't suppress a smile. So because, you know, I sort of instinctively knew that uh, um, in a situation like that, to be liked is quite important. <laughs> and um, and uh, they, there, was a, there was a sense that, you know, as a person, they probably liked me a little. And then when we got to the hotel, Riley uh, actually volunteered the following. He says, Jack, this may ne- not be the worst moment of your life. So that was hint, hint, you can get out of this in some way. And, and I volunteered, I said, hey, listen, I know that the only way that uh, the, this, this, this episode doesn't end up with damage to myself and the family I love is when I, for me to fully and completely cooperate. And I promise I will do so. And so we talked for another, they asked a whole bunch of questions, uh, talked for another like hour and a half. And they allowed me to, uh, they actually made me call Penelope to tell her um, I would be late from work. And then after two hours, they let me go. They had my car, uh, somebody drove it to the hotel. They allowed me to drive home. Not without first um, having uh, the head of the the, uh, surveillance group uh, the security group talked to me. He said, "Just in case, if you think if you think of running, it ain't gonna work because we have we have uh, people at, at all the intersections. You you cannot run. That wasn't necessary to to say, but you know he didn't know that I had no place to run. You know, run to. I mean, you know, n- nothing beckoned." at me to say like okay come here you know this is this is your home no no this was my home and i had no choice so uh, and then we spent uh, about six weeks riley and me interviewing face to face and he asked me about every single detail in my life everything and um, i understand it um, the reason that uh, they decided to to seek my cooperation was the fact that even though I couldn't betray anybody, because I, the, the Russians were very good at this compartmentalization, I didn't know any names. Uh, yeah, right. But the methods and operations uh, were still um, important for the FBI to find out, because we know that the Russians were trained by KGB, and initially there were a lot of KGB that was in Russian intelligence. So. Um, uh, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of tradition and 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 I guarantee you that the FSB and the SVR still have uh, that heritage that they inherited from the KGB. So it was valuable enough, uh, for, and so that when when I passed the lie detector test, um, I was told that you know they they would be working on getting me a green card. And eventually there would be the possibility of becoming a citizen. Um, and uh, because Joe Riley made the right call, he he got uh, a commendation from the director of the FBI because at the time that in, that investigation was number one on the on the list of counterintelligence cases in the United States. So it was a high profile case, and and Riley did well. And uh, we became really, really good friends. <laughs> it's another. Was there a sense of relief? 
Oh, you bet. Now, it was, was let, it? let me tell you, <laughs> until I passed the lie detector test and they told me it's all good, uh, I, that these six weeks, I was stressed out like you wouldn't believe uh, because I, I didn't know what's going to happen. There, the, the implied promise wasn't good enough. There was no direct promise, okay? And so, you know, I still remember I was uh, in, in, uh, on my property on a weekend and I was weed whacking and, and, and my, my brain was going like crazy in, in a loop. The same way it had gone crazy when I had these decisions to make. This was not a decision to make. This was just the unexpected. I didn't know what to expect. That sense of relief was just as, as strong as the sense of surprise when Riley said hello. Yeah, it was was exact opposite, but very strong, and yeah, and and I I knew that I knew that possibly I one of those days I might actually be able to visit Germany again because I would be legalized. I would have I, and if if I get my citizenship, I would travel back to Germany. So it was like wow. All the tension that I had in, in 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 my life up to that point was gone. So they couldn't make you into a double agent because you'd already called it a day, because you were out. No, they couldn't because I was dead. They they told my German family um, that when they t uh, told them about when they actually handed uh, my German wife um, a portion of the money that uh, was saved under my name. And the Order of the Red Banner, she still owns that. <laughs> and then she, then they said, sorry to tell you, your husband oh, right. has passed away. And and the German name that I that yeah. I was under is Albrecht Dittrich. Albrecht Dittrich is listed as dead in the, the German register, whatever that's right. called, the Social Security register. So ev and as, at one point, at one point, an ex classmate uh, who worked for uh, that organization, she, she found that, that entry and, and everybody in Germany knew that I was dead. And all of a sudden, I, one day I show up again. <laughs> so who are you now? Are you, are you really, are you Jack or what? Who are you? I was Jack. I have been Jack for a long time. Uh, with one exception, when I'm in Germany and somebody calls me and I don't even see him and calls my, my first name, I will, I will turn around. I will respond to that. Uh, but only in Germany. If you do it here, I'd probably turn around too and say, what the heck is going on with you? <laughs> you shouldn't know that name. Uh, no, but uh, so uh, my, my, the evolution went uh, down another path. So I was a free um, middle-class American citizen, sort of. I was, I, I was operating on a green card, so I wasn't really fully American. So, but, but this is what, this was the evolution that led me to tell you that uh, today I'm uh, emotionally, intellectually, okay. and legally American. Inter uh, the intellect came first. The, with the anti-communism was uh, the discovery of the U.S. Constitution, which I, which I think is the most mm -hmm. brilliant political document ever written. And it, it so works well with my personality, okay? So that's one. Then emotionally, I became an American in 9-11. Right. And, and then legally, it took some time when I got my citizenship. And I walked out of uh, a Homeland Security office that had sworn me in right then and there. I didn't have to wait for the, one of those uh, occasions when they swear in a whole bunch of people. And I walked out of there, and I finally had a country again. I was home, and, and that's who I am today. What do you do now, Jack? Have you, and you, your, your career is a very specialized career. Do you still engage with FBI, CIA, the U.S. intelligence in some form? Oh, yeah. I got, <laughs> I got about uh, 20 good friends who were, were, at one point were in, in, in intelligence. Um, one of my friends, uh, actually, is, he is uh, one heck of a guy. I mean, we 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 have identical opinions about everything that's going on in, in our country, in the world, family, whatever. 
But but he spent eighteen months undercover in Al Qaeda. Yeah, right. Wow. I mean, how talk about that's scary. taking a risk. Yeah, that's scary. Uh I also am friends with a guy who uh, was undercover with the with the with the South American drug cartel. Oh. He did money laundering for them. Uh that was also somewhat dangerous. As a matter of fact, uh he he actually and I, I believe this man. He is a very honest guy. He he had to kill a couple of mafia guys that were after him. They were going to kill him. Yeah, right. Somehow somebody found out that, uh, you know, he was on the cover. So, so we, I have an interesting set of friends. You're listening to the No Limitations podcast brought to you by Blenheim Partners. Blenheim Partners is an international board and executive search firm working with chairs, directors, CEOs, and senior executives on their most critical people choices. For more information, visit BlenheimPartners.com. Do you still consult, Jack? Do you still get brought in for from you know, the intelligence service and say, can you any from your experience? Or no, you? I do one thing, and that that's a that's a regular appearance. Uh, and Quantico, which is uh, where the FBI has uh, some offices, and there's, there's also other yep. intelligence services and and uh, and the army. Uh, and uh, they they have a um, a seminar they, they in counterintelligence training uh-huh. for the armed forces, and uh, I um, give a presentation periodically. You know, like last year was eight times, and and this year we have planned four, but typically the government. This is like every every bureaucratic organization. When uh, towards the end of the budget year, you start spending the money, or else it will be cut next year. <laughs> so, I can expect a little more towards the end, end of the year. Uh, but that's it. Uh, I was I was carried by the FD, FBI as a trusted source for uh, for until the book came out. When I became a public figure, they made me into a private citizen. And oh, by the way, that may be of interest. There was at one point was. Um, uh, a possibility the F- FBI w- was approached by Australian counterintelligence. They had reason to believe that there was a sleeper left over in Australia. Yeah. And, and they asked, you know, the FBI, can you help out? And they were going to send me to wake this guy up. And somehow they, they, they dropped the idea, but uh, that would have been interesting. <laughs> Leads me to a couple of things, Jack. I'm going to talk about the next step in your life. You publish a book. You've also gone and done a podcast series as well. Talk us through what was the, the motivation to write the book. <laughs> that's, that's another oddity in my life. Um, when, when, I told, when I told my children about my background, they were adults at the time. Uh, my son went from... Oh, my dad is just one of those bureaucrats. He sits in an office and talks all day uh, to, you know, a, an international spy. And he, he blurted out, Dad, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. I says, I don't know if anybody's interested. And then my daughter chimed in. He said, okay. yeah, you should try. And she um, uh, consulted a college professor how to go about. And he said, well, you need to. Uh, send uh, uh, your information uh, to book agents in in the who operate in in true crime in the true crime arena. So I got from this professor. I, I got the names. I emailed them with uh, about you know half a page, maybe three quarter page in the email about my background, and asked them if they would like to represent me. And I got no responses with one exception the guy said you know i can write the book for you for twenty thousand dollars they didn't believe me now i i know now that they didn't believe me uh but i thought nobody's interested in my story so i i dropped the whole thing right okay So, so so now this is how this is how it came about and it's another indication that uh my life was influenced by the action of others in a big way uh so a N- number of things had to ha- happen in sequence that were highly unlikely. First of all, I, and I hired my now ex-wife, and the moment she showed up at the office, I fell in love. I mean, and I had no business pursuing a young lady who worked for me and was 23 years younger. Right. 
Yeah, but uh, we both went through a divorce, and uh, I and we were very cautious not to uh, show anything. And so we started dating, and nobody knew that we we were together. One day, the phone rings, and uh, I understand she picked up the phone, and I understand that that uh, that's somebody she knows quite well. They were both mm-hmm. speaking English, <clears throat> even though they both know patois. But <laughs> but uh, um, she 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 th- then turned to me and said, "My half brother is in the country. He's visiting this guy, who uh, who was sort of a Ersatz er- father. It was a a French painter who traveled around the world and almost adopted him. So." And they still had a relationship, and and this fellow has a uh, a house in the United States, an old farmhouse where he stores a lot of his artwork. So he's visiting him, and then she says, "Where's Hudson?" I said, "It's about an hour from here." So that's uh, another rather interesting coincidence. Okay, so Richard, come, you know, I pick him up, and he comes to our house, and. Uh, my ex-wife had told him about my past, and so he asked me a bunch of questions. He took some notes, and then he said, that is humongous. That's going to be a huge story. Well, I knew that he was a conductor at a railroad at the time. If I couldn't get book agents interested, what the heck would he do? Nothing. Well, he happened to have a a uh, friend with whom he was roommates for a little while who <clears throat> had a doctorate in Chinese studies. And he uh, he consulted some, you know, wealthy, weird people who, uh, who uh, is this Feng Shui or whatever that is in the art of oh, thanks, yeah. arranging your furniture in the yeah, house yeah, yeah, yeah. to uh, yeah. to to ha- have a good spirit uh, yeah. to surround you with. And one of his friends, or his his, his uh, clients, was one of the, the 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 number one female journalist for Der Spiegel. Oh yeah, okay. So he told her, and she was skeptical. So she started doing doing some research. Yeah, right. And uh, she found out that there's probably something that uh, that that would make a really great story. So. Th- the, my ex brother in law arranged a phone call and um, she said, You know, I would like to talk to you, interview you. I said, I can't do that. You know, I'm not even an, an American citizen yet. I need to, I, I can't go in, 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 in the public to before my slate is clean. So, well, I got my citizenship and immediately I applied for a passport and made. Arrangements to to drive to uh, to to fly to Germany, and of course I did tell my brother-in-law that I'm coming. So as I deep plane in uh, in in Berlin, and I walk down the the hallway there, uh, I have a camera and a microphone in my face. This lady followed me through my travels into history for several days and and interviewed me like at at length. And then uh, another coincidence, she had met uh, Steve Croft of 60 Minutes at a conference two years prior, and they, they, had, they were, in, were in contact, and she did something that a no self-respecting journalist would do. She uh, gave away uh, a scoop, story. right? Yeah, right. Yep. Uh, she called him up and said, I got a story for you. Now, I, I found out the reason why she did that, because Steve Croft was the only journalist that Barack Obama had granted face-to-face interviews, and she wanted Obama. Never got him. Right. So, so when I come back from Germany, I get a phone call from the producer of 60 Minutes by the name of Dragan Mihailovic, and he said, um... We we uh, we found out about who you are and your past. We would like to come visit you and talk about what, you know, what we can do together. You know, so that I discussed this with uh, my ex-wife, and I said there is some risk that I would lose my job over this, even though I'm, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't broken any rules. I've made sure that 
when I went in public that uh, that uh, uh, it should be okay based on company rules. And she said, go right ahead. I think God wants you to do that. So we did it. Took a phenomenal trip to Germany. Uh, there was a camera crew and my two children came with me. And it was all, you know, CBS paid for that. So uh, that, that was great. I could show them where I grew up. And and we met, we met the siblings too. I have a picture where all where all four children are, and I are, are together. Okay. So, and when I come back from that trip, uh, oh, no, hold it. And when when sixty minutes aired on a Sunday, on Monday, the general counsel of the company I worked for called me into his office and said, Jack. We watched 60 Minutes. <clears throat> you are now uh, on paid leave until further notice. Right. Okay. So after two weeks, I got uh, a note from the lawyer that I was uh, um, I, I was um, dismissed uh, for cause. In other words, I they they thought I was guilty of something, and I got myself an attorney and convinced them that I broke no law. There was, there was no way that, that, that they can defend that. And so we sat down and, and worked out an NDA and I got a going away present. I, I'm not allowed to mention the name of the company. Uh, suffice it to say, they, they operated in the energy industry and there was some concern. It was mostly reputational damage that they had an ex-KGB agent in, in their ranks and, and they didn't know about it. Didn't you fill that in the form when you started? No. Are you an ex-KGB <laughs> Have you ever been? <laughs> yes. Um, um, and and um, I don't know if there was a question as to whether I was ever a member of the Co Communist Party of the United States, which right. I could have answered with a straight no. But have you ever been a member of a communist party? That would have been if I say if I said yes, I don't get, get the job. If I say no, I broke I broke the rules. I could get, get fired. So uh, I, I got lucky that way again. And uh, and again, uh, my life changed one more time drastically because now I had to find out how to make a living. Did the sixty minutes do you well? Uh, it had altogether. It was repeated twice, and it had, it had uh, 15 million viewers altogether. But 60 minutes, just like the BBC, do not pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't pay. But but I'm now out in public. Okay. Yep. yep. And and at that point, uh, the the book agents uh, became very interested. Right, and so I, I pretty soon I had a contract uh, to write a write a book. Uh, but the other thing, and I didn't know that I was a good writer, but I am. I'm a very good writer. I've been told many times by people who know what they're talking about. Yep. Uh, and um, um, deep undercover is the title of the book, and it's uh, it, it, it's it got a four point six rating on Amazon. Yeah, which, that's a good book. Which beats Harry Potter by point one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but then my my uh, pathological optimism kicked in when I when I told uh, my daughter and, and uh, my ex wife, you know what? I'm just going to do some public speaking and make money that way. All right. Well, look, I'm lucky not to be speaking with someone like yourself today, and I'd be silly if I didn't ask a number of questions around geopolitics and what's happening out there. Sure. Based on your experience. All right. What are we seeing in terms of U.S. leadership? We've got leaks, Jack. Man, we are doing a horrendous job protecting secrets that should be protected the way, uh, the, way the nuclear plants protect uh, their, their facility. You know the most, the, the Ames and the, the, uh, the Hansen story, they, they're, they're a few, several years back, they're still alive in jail, but... Um, but just the, the, what, what happened this past week, that uh, some minor IT employees uh, uh, who works for, uh, on contract for the Air Force, I believe, mm. was able to get his hands on highly secret materials of what the 
CIA had done and knows and methods and operations, and shared this with his with his um, uh, group of nerds who who are not very very functional in society. He was he just wanted to impress them, and somehow it got out, and now it's a big scandal. And quite frankly, I I am I am not happy with the way our our federal government is responding to this. There should be outrage. There should be should, somebody should be calling for massive changes. Nobody's doing this. They're like saying, "Oh, we, we're investigating." We, you know, it's like. Let's just make this go away. Well, this is cowardice. This is political behavior. This is not how you should operate as a as a government whose primary responsibility is the security and the safety of the people that you are governing. So I'm I'm not happy with that, and I'm I'm also not not happy with the uh, with the wokeness. Uh, Sort of uh, entering, making, making, having at least a foothold in the U.S. military. Mm. I'm not against women b- being in the in the armed forces, but I'm against the, the women have to have some bit of a male behavior in themselves if they want to see combat duty, right? Uh, yep. And they can. I'm not denying that. Uh, but uh, if you treat men like women and and soften them you take you 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 taking the you 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 are weakening the war machine to a point where it uh, where it becomes not functional anymore that that trend needs to be reversed but you know your experience if you look at that ever since the red line or crimea oh yeah the us mm-hmm. has lost its way a little bit and then afghanistan i guess is the icing on the cake yeah we 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 signaled signaled weakness to when barack obama says well you know we russians you, you 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 can't use chemical weapons that's a red line and we will not we will not allow that and then when when putin dared it anyway nothing happened and then um the invasion of the ukraine not not a not a peep as if this was okay with us it wasn't uh, it uh, and 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 that uh, encouraged uh, Putin to invade Ukraine. The other thing with regard to what uh, also triggered that invasion was, I think NATO got too close to uh, to the to to the so to the to the Russian border, and that again it, there has been uh, a history of mutual ignorance with regard to. The United States knows what's important to Russia and vice versa. The CIA uh, had no clue that the Soviet Union would would f- come down. They did they did not un- understand the Russian soul. The Russians didn't understand uh, how America operates, and it's the same today. Except we have some experts in our country that know Russia very well. Except they don't they're not listened to, and so that thing with NATO. And, and they could have asked me, because I know about the history of Russia, and I know that Russia uh, has been, and since its uh, uh, founding as a nation in the Middle Ages, has been invaded all the time. From the north, the Vikings came in. From from the from the east, there was the the Mongols. The the south, the Turks, and then. Yep. Uh, did I say east? Yeah, and, and from the west, yeah, did. yeah, yeah, yeah from yeah. from the west, uh, it was Napoleon, and of course Hitler. So there is a it, 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 the the Russian, and I call that the Russian na- national DNA, has a huge gene that says paranoia. We're afraid because we we've, we've always been attacked, and you know th- that's the truth. Now, uh, if it, and and so it it is. I think even that paranoia is, is also part of uh, Vladimir Putin's DNA, but he ha- he has a leverage to have his country follow him by blaming the West for everything that that's not really working very well in, in his country. So they they know that um, you know there there are some villages not too far from Moscow that have no electricity, and they know that you know that they. 
they can't get their hands on decent goods and and life is not that great that's that's not the putin government fault it's the fault of the west that that are strangling uh russia and are getting ready to possibly invade and and that is a very very strong argument so when people say that think when the when the the war started and people w- were predicting that you know the the russian people would rise up when 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 the dead bodies are coming home and uh when when uh life would get even tougher uh the majority of the russians still support putin's war today how much longer can the ukrainians go i i i just don't yeah. i just don't know um when if if nato uh, continues to support ukraine and, and, and provides the weapons that ukraine needs it could go on for a long time and just maybe maybe i mean this could this this war could go on for 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 an, an immeasurable period of time unless maybe there is some reason trickling into the thinking both of uh, uh Putin yeah. and Zelensky uh because um you know the 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 determination of of uh Ukraine to fight to the last person is still there and um they are not willing to give up some land to save women and children the 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 lines are so hard that i don't i don't see uh, a, a, any quick resolution and unfortunately that war is a danger to the existence uh, of humanity because i'm not i'm not i'm not thinking that putin will purposely uh explode a nuke because he's not suicidal there however you know there's a possibility that he 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 he's gone he goes comp- completely nuts and then some then there may have been others who are not suicidal and would stop him because i don't believe i don't know what their regimen is and, and h- how a nuclear weapon can be uh fired off by president putin put pushing a button the the t- the, the the technical circumstances require some some army person and maybe two or three of them so um but w- what i'm more concerned with is um the you know the, as the tension increases um and um and american politicians are screaming that putin is a war criminal and and you know in this in a, in an atmosphere like that eventually uh, there's a possibility of a, a of a um accidental release of such a weapon we had this during uh the cold war the, the we we had these situations and and the other thing i'm worried about is you know how, how well maintained the russian nuclear arsenal is you know it's very old <clears throat> and 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 yeah, right. we know that the russians already have uh have uh, been sending conventional old dated conventional we- weapons in, into that war so there's again there's a lot of danger to the world jack you and mr putin share one thing in common you both came or students from the kgb you've got better insight than most people on this planet what how does he think what motivates him what should we be looking at bearing in mind where the world is at now the the one thing i want want to start answering that you didn't ask that question because people have asked me what he learned in the kgb that made him such a mm. um such a strong force in russia and and i say he he didn't learn that 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 was some some quality that he had what what he what he did very well he networked cuz actually from a classic kgb agent summary you wouldn't put him in in the top league would you he wasn't an operative you know they, they, you don't you, you you don't put your best agents in a in a friendly country he he was like herman you know he was a uh, he was a middle level bureaucrat who did a little bit of spy stuff on the side um but that that 
he he used that time very well in terms of setting himself up for the future. So so we both had this one thing in common. When was a true statement? Uh, the West overestimated the KGB to some degree. But you know, when when there's a secret organization, you don't you don't know you don't know what they're doing, right? So so he, here he is in in Dresden in the, in the southeast of uh, uh, Germany. And um, this was just before the wall came down. Yep, right about this. There were demonstrations. And some of those demonstrations uh, uh, stormed Stasi offices. And they, they destroyed stuff. And then and some of them saved stuff for the future. And there were demonstrations in front of the place where the KGB was located. And uh, there may have been Soviet military too, and um, that got a little dangerous. You know, there was a there was a p potential that uh, those people would just you know enter the building by force. Uh, so here's Vladimir Putin, and he called Berlin, and he asked for permission to use firearms if they are being attacked. And um, when he checked with Berlin, he got the following response. Moscow is silent. So in, in a very brief period of time, Putin was working for, uh, who had worked for a very powerful organization, uh, was powerless to control a crowd. So that that was a sign of phenomenal weakness he he figured and uh, fecklessness and i he talked about it and and that sort of sort of shaped his uh his character to some degree because he was and he was out in public uh in front of a large audience some few a few years ago quite a few years ago when when he stated that he was his, his mission was to re rebuild Russia's greatness. Okay, that was known. And um, and in in the process, he also wants to build a, a legacy for himself and his own greatness. Right? You know, you, you got to have a huge ego to to lead the way he leads. You know, he he is not. You know, there was this uh, this one tape that the BBC shot where he uh, um, mm -hmm. he he interacted with the head of the S mm -hmm. SVR, uh, the one of the intelligence services, and uh, and he treated that man, who supposedly should have been a little powerful, he treated him treated him like a little boy, and he made him repeat verbally what he said he should answer. Okay, so that's that's a huge ego, and there's a lot of narcissism, and um, and and there's there's also quite a bit of uh, anxiety, fear, because that famous picture where he's sitting on this long table with with the I think the French, yeah, I think it would be, yeah, I think it is, yep, president, I think, like, and and there's somebody who had some. <clears throat> I forgot what he was, but there's somebody who had uh, personal access to Putin who who fled Russia, and he uh, he, he told people that he, he is uh, uh, he's just very much afraid of catching a bug or a virus. So you don't know how uh, how far how widespread that fear is, and how it extends to other things. There's a lot of speculation. Um, I I. Uh, I have been in touch with a fellow who has been studying Putin. He's a medical doctor studying Putin and, a, and a, somewhat of an expert in Russia from a distance. And that was um, maybe six months ago. He came to the conclusion that he still is of a sound mind. But, you know, people, people sometimes do go crazy uh, over time. And, and the pressure on him is pretty big. He must... He must find a way to declare victory or else his legacy is destroyed. You know, it doesn't mean that he has to conquer all of Ukraine, but he must find a way to say, well, we did the job against against all of NATO. 
okay? Because he, you know, he he tells his people that he's he's fighting, he's fighting with NATO. Um, but Jack, what about the likes and, of and, the withdrawal and, out of Afghanistan? So, you yeah, know, that, that you can was, read it, and we're going to review it and keep reviewing that, and reviewing it. It was a case study. Was that a trigger for Putin to have confidence to move into, to take on the Ukraine? It, it, yeah, that w- would have added to. Um, his, um, you know, his his perception of U.S. competence and willingness to, you know, make a stronger stand. Uh, that we are weak, and then and then we get into a point where, where uh, also we have a, the the both the Republicans, or not all of them, but both Republicans and Democrats are trying yeah. to trump each other. Yep. No, no pun intended here. Uh, with anti-Russian and anti-Putin statements, and it's politics that uh, that is behind mm-hmm. this, right? They want to see, like you know, the America, you know, is making strong statements. But when you call Vladimir Putin mm-hmm. a war criminal, what does it do to the the balance of power in that war? Nothing. All it does it insults Putin, and he doesn't. Like being criticized or insulted, that he takes that takes it very seriously. So you're, you're ratcheting yeah, right. up the tension again. You need to be cool and strong. You know, you know we need a Ronald Reagan. Uh, we don't, I don't see one, but certainly the administration that we have now is uh, is is borderline competent. They're focused on a, a lot of things. I mean, the the focus is right now again on on green initiatives nice. big time and uh and just yesterday they were uh, sharing plans to nationalize at least the charging ch- stations for electronic vehicles to choke off the the you know the the, the car industry that uh, makes the types of cars that i like to, to yep. <laughs> drive <laughs> it's uh it's a it's a Lousy picture, and I don't know what it's like in Australia. Well, I guess what we're watching is, um, well, one, the U.S. is an ally of ours. We've just done a major agreement with called AUKUS. Yeah, got, yeah, that, the, that is a positive development. Well, yeah, well, and I guess the, the reason being is around the Southeast Asian waters and Asia Pacific, and uh, as you now we we could be isolated fairly easy based on it. Chinese Navy, which is increasing at rapid rates, yeah. um, but you know who knows which one the play is. The ideology, I guess, maybe Jack, because I'm not a communist, um, but the ideology between the Russians and the Chinese, you know, look at history. That hasn't hasn't been always the same. Yes, they've had some they've had some commonality, but not 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 necessarily the same. Where is that relationship now? Well, it's a it's a marriage of convenience. Okay. When you when you talk about uh, that. Uh, uh, there's an acronym that has to. Um, I forgot. I can't. I can't uh, name the the con- countries in the right order. Russia, China, India, and um, they, they're sort of allied in some some way. But every well, you now got Sa- you now got Saudi Arabia weighing things up as well. Oh yeah. Well, that's interesting now that. Um, and again, that's that's a sign of American weakness because every every country that when you talk about. Uh, New world order, and that's nonsense. The national nationalism is still is still dominant. Every country will do what they think is best for them. So does India. All of a sudden, align themselves with with Russia. That's the other country, by the way. Uh, yeah. And and Saudi Arabia thinks now that um, that they're better off uh, being allied with with Russia and making peace with Iran, even though. They're, they have been throughout history deathly enemies. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's not a good sign, <clears throat> and uh, uh, and then we're talking about uh, the the efforts partially successful of the Chinese to replace the dollar as the currency uh, yes. with, with which to trade. Absolutely, and and if if Saudi Arabia and 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 the, and, and the OPEC buys into that. Uh, that uh, that will weaken the United States even more, and there is nothing done to change that. You know the the 
the shitty energy policy that uh, the Biden regime started is 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 suicidal. Right. Yeah, because we we are now buying we are now buying oil and natural gas when when we when we used to export this and used to be completely energy independent after having you know been subject to uh, OPEC uh, uh, d determining how much they would sell us and and how much it would cost we be we became energy independent and we have all we have all the reserves to do it again but uh, there's nothing there's nothing really aggressively in, in, uh, done in and in motion to to get us there so i don't know how how much of a uh, a window we have to reverse course i'm i'm typically i told you i'm an optimistic guy yeah but uh i'm growing more and more pessimistic uh, every day and, and i don't i i try to avoid the news as much as i can but I can't. So is the propaganda machine just as strong as it was when you were a young man? It isn't so much propaganda. It isn't so much propaganda. It, it is the Chinese are, um, yep. are, are throwing their economic power into the mix. And, and who enabled them to become, become that powerful as they are now? American companies. Greed. And, and, and the U.S. government... The U.S. government, uh, when when the ping pong policy was underway, and there was you know Nixon and uh, and China were, were making peace, we we ha the Americans have this fundamentally idiotic belief that all we have to do is you know help countries uh, show the way, and they will become like us, and we we were sort of deluded that the Chinese would become a very friendly nation the same way we were deluded when uh, and most recently when when hillary clinton declared uh, a reset with russia that was naive we this is their this is this messianic uh, uh attitude towards the world that you know we are america we know how not, we know how to live and we tell all of you and you will be better off sort of similar to <laughs> the communist ideology it's 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 ideology. It's it doesn't work, and it has has not been shown to work anywhere. It didn't work in Iraq. Uh, it, it didn't work in Afghanistan, and no matter where you try it, and it uh, and and it uh, it hasn't worked in Africa. Uh, you know, you look look at what's happening in Ethiopia. They, these people are killing one another like you wouldn't believe. Uh, it's it's the, the world is not a nice place and has never been. But right now it's worse than in the better days uh, when when the cold the cold war was over. Yeah, a lot of people are going to be listening to this, and I'm sure a lot of people to listen to your other stories. I'm it's a pretty obvious question, and I'm sure some of them have asked it. But Jack, why has Putin now that he's been powerful for what, twenty twenty plus years? Why does he allow an ex-agent still to walk around and talk about the old days? Why haven't you had that knock on the door yet? If he had it, no. If he had an opportunity to um, send a message after so many years, he would take advantage of it, and that's the reason I would never ever you 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 offer me ten million dollars, I wouldn't go to Russia. Uh, there's also some neighboring countries where. Um, where there's a lot of lawlessness, uh, I would avoid Turkey, for instance, and 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 the the the, the state of Georgia, not Georgia in the U.S., and a, and a few other places. Um, I wouldn't have a problem with the Baltic countries, even though they're physically close. Um, but you know, if I wind up, if I go to Moscow, I probably have an accident, and fall out of a window, and it, and and. You know, the message will be, we'll get you no matter how long, how much time uh, expired. Now, here, here's the thing, and, and I've discussed it with the FBI, um, and we are in agreement. Um, the first thing needs to be considered, I, was, I did not defect. I was discovered. Okay? So, and I, I was not a Russian citizen. I did not betray the motherland, which makes it less of a crime, regardless even I was KGB, and if you can send a message, you will. But here's here's the the thing that uh, gets in the way. Uh, 
the teams that can go to another country and kill somebody there are highly specialized and there aren't too many of them. And you know that when when the the GRU team that uh, poisoned Skripal, they they were they were they actually made mistakes and and it was traced back to the GRU. But they still got away with it. Yeah, they right, but they have a limited number of, of specialty teams. And if if Vladimir has a list of people that he would like to do away with, I, I wouldn't be very much at the top. So um, I I feel totally safe in the United States. And I've tra- traveled in Western Europe, and that wasn't a problem either. You still go under the name Jack Bosky when you travel? Yeah, sure. Oh, right. it, 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 it's in my passport, uh, my passport, right? Okay. Fair enough. Jack, if you're going to look back at that young Albrecht all those years ago, sitting in there that Saturday morning, and a knock on the door, and about to have a conversation, what advice would you give him now? Don't do it. Don't do it. And and the and the reason, the reason I'm saying that, uh, and and Joe Riley actually wrote this in his uh, forward to my book. This kind of life uh, will damage you in some ways. You know, there's there's something that you cannot overcome. Uh, like like a minor thing. I I get extremely nervous when somebody knocks on my door. When they ring the bell, it's different. When it, when there's a knock, I like oh. <laughs> um, and and the other thing that that I uh, should admit, uh, the moment I stepped on the territory of the United States, that was you know Chicago. Uh, I was extremely tense. And. I wanted to go to sleep in the worst way. And I had bought a, a bottle of Johnny Walker Red at, uh, at the airport, you know, free of... Uh, oh, duty free. What is it called? Yeah. 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 And, um, and I went to my hotel room and I drank half of it. I put myself into a coma. I mean... Not literally, yeah, yeah. but you know, I, I, I had a comatose-like sleep and woke up with a huge headache. Uh, but from that point on, I thought I needed alcohol to go to sleep, and I became a high-functioning alcoholic. I mean, nobody—I never missed a day at work. Never, no, no, and I, I didn't go to work with you know smelling like this. But it was the the habit in the evening. Well, that's not good for you. You know, it took it took a, a lot of effort to to get this under control. So don't do it. And and you know, and it the other thing is, you know, I I have friends now that are in the in their late forties, early fifties, and I they are really really good friends and good people. And I we meet and I tell them that you are about thirty years ahead of me in in terms of becoming who you who you could become. So it took me 70 years to get to a point where I I think I'm there. I I think I learned all my lessons and I feel really comfortable in my own skin. That was not the case. So there was there was a long period when I didn't know who I was. And when I really um and when you don't know who you were, you you rely on the opinion of other people. But that that's not a good thing because you become a people pleaser and, and you you know you t- tell people what they want to hear. So yeah. I'm not there anymore. I can speak the truth in love. Uh, one thing I also learned is um, you know not be negative anymore. It is illogical to issue negative uh, signals because when you issue negative signals, you get negative signals back. And that is fundamentally self-destructive. Now that that took me a while to, so I'm, but I'm really there now. I, um, I, I talk with uh, folks all the time, and and they, they, they listen to what I'm saying. Younger people, they think, oh man, that sounds interesting, and 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 that detour, cost me many many 
good years. Well, Jack, this has been one of the most interesting discussions I've ever had. Thank you very much for your time. And on that, you have been listening to No Limitations. <laughs>